Perspectives, the podcast edition. My name is Leland. I'm your host and the author of The Cosmism Manifesto. And we're right in the middle of part 14 or episode 14 on the podcast. Um, we're reading our article that's titled The Scriptures in an Electric Universe, Part 3. And um, we'll just pick right back up. So we left off on this section called The Template of a Mighty Nation. And we're going to be walking into or kind of treading through uh, the chapters of Exodus 18 and 19. Jesus Christ is the ultimate nation builder and covenant keeper. His kingdom rules all of heaven and will eventually rule all of earth once the building is complete. We are currently in the Exodus, where Jesus, then as pre-mortal Jehovah, is beginning to train this newly birthed nation of Israel to become a Zion society like Melchizedek and Enoch before. He wants to fulfill the covenants he made with the fathers, to use Israel to bless all the nations of the earth. The unfolding of this covenantal design begins with Abraham. Well, we know it begins with Adam, but when I'm we talk about the Abrahamic covenant. This is what I mean, that Abraham's the new Adam after Melchizedek and his city is taken up and translated. So this unfolding of this covenantal design begins with Abraham and continues on even now and will culminate at the Lord's second coming in power. When the Lord came at the meridian of time, he upgraded his church and law to Israel and instituted a missionary system to cast a wider gospel nation building net to the whole of both mortal and spirit worlds. He sent his apostles out to the Gentiles And he went through and set up missionary work in the spirit world during the three days that he was uh, in there in paradise. Um, So we know that he expanded the work of this nation building, of inviting all to come unto the chosen people, essentially, to come and be a part of, of Israel. He made the resurrection a reality, and he promised to return. The restoration of that same church of Jesus Christ, but in these latter days, after the great and prophesied apostasy of the meridian of church, It is the continuation of that same building project by the Lord promised to Abraham. And I don't think I, now after reading it, I don't know if I did a good job of uh, clarifying. Like the point I'm trying to make here to start this is that what the Lord is doing, what Jehovah is doing with Israel, this corrupt, idolatrous, uh, enslaved people who had been enslaved by Egypt and corrupted to their moralities and their understanding of things. And so he had to retrain that first generation or at least enough that they could teach the law properly to their children and give them a a chance once they did get into the promised land. But that it's been this ongoing process since then to train up Israel in the laws of the celestial kingdom. And it's been ongoing. And so the restoration of the the Latter-day Church here for us is a continuation of that same, uh, those same covenants given to Abraham. And that's why we have the prophet today, President Nelson, telling us to look and study those covenants made to uh, the, the fathers, right? Made to Israel and watch for them to be fulfilled in our day, that that's the day we're living in. It's amazing. When you start to see these things zoomed out, connecting the dots from that context, from the eternal perspective, you start to feel the weight of the words of the current prophet. Let's read in Moses 7, again, from the book of Moses, since I, th- I feel like it's appropriate. And here in the book of Moses that we have in the Pearl of Great Price, we have this, again, hearkening back to Zion, to uh, Enoch, to his people, and to the promises that the Lord made to him. So let's read that real quick. It says, In Moses 7, verses 50 through 53. And it came to pass that Enoch continued his cry unto the Lord, saying, I ask thee, O Lord, in the name of thine only begotten, even Jesus Christ, that thou wilt have mercy upon Noah and his seed, that the earth might never more be covered by the floods. And the Lord could not withhold. And he covenanted with Enoch. And he sware unto him with an oath that he would stay the floods and he would call upon the children of Noah. And he set forth an unalterable decree that a remnant of his seed should always be found among all nations while the earth should stand. So he's talking to Enoch Enoch here, and he's promising him that a remnant of your seed, a remnant of Noah's seed, Noah and his seed, they will survive. I will bring them through. And what does he say about it? He says in verse 53, And the Lord said, Blessed is he 
through whose seed Messiah shall come. For he saith, I am Messiah, the King of Zion, the Rock of Heaven, which is broad as eternity. Whoso cometh in at the gate and climbeth up by me shall never fall. Wherefore, blessed are they of whom I have spoken, for they shall come forth with songs of everlasting joy. So he even promises to Enoch that I will even come through that seed, that line. The Lord Jehovah had previously covenanted with Enoch and his Zion society who were taken up, that his seed through Noah, or a remnant thereof, would always be found among all nations while the earth should stand. And that's right here in verse 52. That a remnant of his seed should always be found among all nations while the earth should stand. This section will be a tie back directly to our uh, essay titled uh, Kings and uh, Kingdoms. And if you haven't listened or read that one, um, it's kind of necessary. Oh, I guess I go to the video for it. Kind of necessary uh, to understand kind of how why I'm tying this in so much. But let's remember that the priesthood and kingship are administrative titles and roles. One to administer the word and ordinances and tithing of the gospel to the church, and the other to administer the law and the order and economy to the state as a whole. Ecclesiastical and governmental. This should be a reminder when we're talking about what the, the kingdom of God actually is. It's both ecclesiastical, as it stands today, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God on earth, but it is only the ecclesiastical portion. You have things like the Council of 50, and um, you wanna, we want to dive into that history a little later. That's the political side of the kingdom that was restored, but is lying dormant, we'll say, as the kingdoms of the world are essentially collapsing, as this stone cut without hand, truth, um, be told, will knock them all over. So this was just a reminder, bringing this image back in, that this is what we're talking about when we say priesthood and kingship, right? We're talking about priesthood in the ecclesiastical sense and kingship in the political sense being actual titles, um, that the Lord is preparing not just um, a, a nation, a people that will accept him as their high priest and their king, but a nation of kings, a nation of high priests. That's what he's been promising this whole time, that we can become co-heirs like him. So he's training us in his ways, essentially, the ways of the prince. So a Zion celestial society is the perfect synthesis of both ecclesiastical and political administrations, the ideal state, the ideal republic, right? Focus back now on the historical episode at hand. Israel, this promised nation of approximately three million of the seed of Abraham and of Noah and of Enoch, was just powerfully delivered from a corrupt pharaoh, a ruler, right? So, And, and the pharaoh is running in ruler's law, which is like a satanic inversion of how government should be. The, um, and in Egypt, the violence of the Red Sea was a fractal casting down. So, I mean, it's just a, an image, a type, a similitude um, of worldly thrones and the kingdom of Pharaoh or Egypt, or as the kingdom of Pharaoh of Egypt in this case, and the setting up of the divine throne or the kingdom of Jehovah of Israel. So you have on one hand the casting down of Pharaoh and the worldly thrones, or it would have been like Abraham in, in, in you know, casting down the idols and um, basically the, when the angel miraculously saves him from the sacrifice before the king or from, before uh, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt then, that he's let go once the high priest is, is uh, struck by the angel like we saw before. Um, that would have been the same thing, the, the casting down of earthly thrones by God and the setting up of Abraham's throne as being um, truly uh, authoritative. This is the same thing we're seeing happening again with Moses and Israel as Pharaoh's throne was cast down, his wheel throne, his chariot. And I have an image here that I just generated uh, that kind of depicts this, where you have Pharaoh and his and his uh, chariot being consumed in the Red Sea, being cast down on the left, and then you have Jehovah's throne, the Lord Jesus Christ's throne being established, his law, his rule, his nation, his kingdom being built and set up upon Horeb or Sinai um, on the other side of the river. So you have this this uh, j this casting down and 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 uh, setting up like we talked about before with Daniel's visions and leading towards Adam on Diamond in the millennium, what we're looking for. It's that same thing. It's the ushering in of the kingdom of God um, in its full power and glory at the millennial day. But for now, with Israel, this is setting up the initial template. He's pulling out a raggedy people out of Egypt to train them up to be high priests and kings. So from here on out, the scriptures tell the story of how this people, Israel, were given a new or renewed word and law that led to a, and led to a promised land by God to prepare them to become a Zion society, like Enoch and his people. The nation-building project begins in earnest. Now, with our 2020, or 2023, hindsight, we know that they fail over and over and over again. Only Moses makes it to translation, or to Zion, after 40 years of wandering. The rest are left to reset and retry as often as they repent. Now, we're still pride cycling, even after the first advent of the Savior and his Meridian Church, uh, after that structure was set up and then the subsequent great apostasy and the glorious restoration and coming forth of the Book of Mormon, 
will continue to be tested with the, the pride cycle of failing and, and trying and failing until the doors of the wedding feast of the bridegroom are shut and locked at his glorious finale. Now, in Exodus chapter 18, we find a pivotal training session for Moses in the government of Israel from his father-in-law and high priest, Jethro. So let's read that in Exodus verses 13 through 18. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. So all day long, standing there. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that they did to the people, all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest with the people? Why sittest thou uh, by them, uh, thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning to evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Well, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. So again, uh, Moses is in this same Pharaoh ruler's mindset where everything has to go through him, essentially. When they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statues of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, This thing that thou doest is not good. Thou, sh thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Now remember, there's three million people that Moses is administering to, and basically bottlenecking it and funneling it all through him at this point. So Jethro's like, this isn't going to work. Moses was only ever trained in Pharaoh's court of ruler's law, where all the power is concentrated in the ruler. He was trying to perform all of the tasks listed in the image below by himself. Now let's read this. I, I took this from uh, Cleon Skousen's The Making of America book. Uh, very good. Highly recommend it. It goes in detail into the Constitution and things like that. But initially, there's a section here that talks about the, the inspiration for the founding fathers in uh, how they set up the initial republic, um, an American union and covenant. So uh, here they have a picture, an upside down triangle where you have Moses at the top. And I'm going to read this. It says the leader was responsible for solving all problems, including those involving. So this is what Moses was trying to do by himself. Agriculture, bartering, census, clothing, complaints, construction, crafts, dairying, deaths, diet, discipline, education, employment, entertainment, farming, fu food, fuel, health, immigration, justice, livestock, maintenance, manufacturing, marriage, military issues, matters, religion, revenue, safety, sanitation, scribes, servants, shelters, shepherding, standards, storage, supplies, taxes, transportation, travel, water, welfare, probably more, right? And he was trying to do this for what? For more than 600 families, 600,000 families which was more than 3 million individuals. So I'm going to read these here. It says, Moses originally tried to govern with the Israelites under ruler's law. With some 3 million people, it was an awesome task. So uh, here's Jethro. He responded after witnessing the inefficient administration of Moses. And he's like, this isn't going to work. He instructs Moses in the manner in which he should organize the people and delegate responsibilities. Now remember, again, his priesthood class, that he's the high priest of Melchizedek that uh, gives the priesthood essentially to Moses. So in in Moses uh, in Ex Moses Moses in Moses eighteen, hearken, in Exodus eighteen verses nineteen through twenty four it reads, "Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt te teach them ordinances and laws. So he's like, do what you're doing. You're right. Teach them the ordinances and laws, but teach them that they shall show them the way wherein they must walk, that they uh, and the work that they must do." Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetous, uh, covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be, that every great matter that they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So it shall be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all this people shall, go, uh, shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. So he's suggesting a flipping of this triangle that Moses um, has here. He's trying to put it all on himself. So he suggests, hey, teach them what they need to do. You're right. That needs to be done. You have to teach them. Teach them the law. But... Pick out from the men able leaders, holy men, men who fear God, men who don't you know, easily succumb to sin, that they can be judges and leaders over the others. So he's saying basically delegate power to other people to help you. So under ruler's law, government assumes all power and imposes its will on the people top down. This is the inverted triangle we were just looking at Moses using. So where it's basically 100% tyranny, right? 
And if we're looking at a government like the monarchy that the early American founders were leaving, it was essentially this, where you have all the power in the ruler, and then it trickles down, right? Under ruler's law, government assumes all power and imposes its will on the people. And the ideal state would be to move this over to people's law, or like an, a law of agency, that the, that's God's law, essentially, that yes, there's a celestial way and a right way to do it, but it's got to be by uh, your choice, essentially. But what Jethro is teaching Moses is to invert the pyramid and to spread the responsibility and the people or and the power to the people. So here's how Moses sets it up with Moses or how Jethro and, and the Lord and Moses set this up. There you have Moses and then his, his counselors, Aaron and, and Joshua, or who becomes also the vice president over the military. He's the one he sends to fight Amalek. Then you have a council of 70, like a Senate. You have elected representatives out of the, the bodies there, Congress. Then you have the larger congregation broken into these groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And this is the same structure that um, the Anglo-Saxons used in, in their building up of cities and things up north. And then also that the founding fathers once again looked to. They looked to this Israelite, um, how to organize and break down large groups of people or a nation state uh, in thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and into wards and things like that, into uh, counties or, or communities, townships, um, that kind of thing. Um, and it, they just became more easily governed when you had captains over these reporting on up the chain. So this way you had more than 3 million people with the power to govern them themselves. And again, these are approximate numbers based on the census in uh, Numbers 1 verse 2. It says that one of the first things they do when they come out of the Red Sea is they number all of the able-bodied men, military age men, things like that, and families, heads of families, um, and come up with like a census. Now, in Cleon Skousen's book, The Making of America, and in several of his other books, he outlines the evidence for how the Founding Fathers drew major inspiration for laying the foundation of this American nation from the governing principles taught in the Old Testament to Moses from the Lord. The Founders saw their mission to establish a nation of liberty, of freedom, as tied to the Old Testament covenants that God made with the seed of Abraham. Because Israel was all about liberty, freedom. They were leaving slavery, right? Let my people go, that, that whole idea. The Founding Fathers looked and found inspiration in that and in the laws that uh, the Lord revealed to Moses to govern such a large people. Now, we know that these men were inspired to set up a nation in which the freedom of religion and restoration of the gospel in the last days could germinate and take final root. Our scriptures say that these were inspired men. So it is an echo and similar to how the Israelites needed to be liberated from a tyrannical monarch first before being led to a promised land where they could attempt to practice the given laws from God to build up a Zion society. Do you see how it parallels now the founding of America? Well, again, leaving a tyrannical monarchy being led to a promised land of prosperity where they could attempt to practice given laws from God to build up a Zion society. This is why you had the religious explosion coming through with uh, the, you know, simultaneously in harmony with the building of America. You had everybody reading the Bible and revivals, right, of wanting to read and understand and know and build up this Zion society, the right community of God, the right temple of God. How do we do this, right? And this is where you had so many different disagreements. And this is the culture in which Joseph Smith grew up asking the question, which of all these churches is right? And this was the this he was the seed germinated in that in that bed created by the founding fathers looking back to this covenant with Israel, being direct seed of Israel, and being again a prophet called by the Lord Himself to raise up once again this uh, Zion society on this promised land. So here you have again an image of how our government is set up, like we said, moving it over from ruler's law over to people's law. We have the federal government here, several states, thousands of counties tens of thousands of communities, tens of millions of families, and hundreds of millions of individuals. So under people's law, in which the balanced center of the founders, which is, the, uh, which is in the balanced center of the founders' political spectrum, governmental power on every level comes from the people themselves. So in chapter four of another one of Skousen's books titled The Cleansing of America, he breaks down the administrative instructions given to Moses as the seven steps in setting up God's law, or to keep things coherent here, these are the, the steps needed to set up this Zion-like society and nation-state, his kingdom. So he uses them as a parallel to the Latter-day building going on now in America. They are as follows. First, one, census of families. And we just talked about that. Numbers 1-2, um, the Lord sets up, what does it say? Take ye a sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, male, every male by their poles, uh, from 20 years old and upward. All that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou shalt, uh, thou and Aaron shalt number them by their armies. So there's where the census is one of the first things that happens when they come through. 
Then he says step two is to divide them into tens, fifties, hundreds, one, uh, thousands. These are the delegates and representatives that are set up. And then three, organize into self-governing wards. Think about our modern church as well. This is exactly how it's set up with the first presidency, just like Moses up at the top with his counselors. Then you have the 70, or you, I mean, you have the apostles and the 70, and then uh, down into regions, stakes, wards, and then individual families, and then individuals. So same setup that we have with the modern church. It's the same as Israel, same as the government setting up, basically. Like, this is inspired. When you look at these things through this lens, um, it begins to, for me, just support my testimony even more. <laughs> like, these are these are areas and crutches of, of my testimony that you didn't know existed until you start to look kind of thing. And then when you do, they become powerful um, support systems for it. So next was to set up a system of judges, right? Pick out wise men from me, these delegates over them. And same thing here in America. You got the judicial system. Um, well, our three-tiered governmental system is meant to be one of checks and balances, but also a judicial system of judges to administrate or to um, interpret the law. So, and then five, make certain everyone knows uh, the law. Okay, so this is important. And I would say that number one, like, um, operation right now of the church is this <laughs> is to make sure everybody's educated with come follow me and pushing the responsibility back onto the families onto the fathers for the instruction and and this push of like hey you're responsible for your own testimony your own education but um the i mean the church does dang well sure to let us know what the milk and the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are like uh, they can't say that we haven't been instructed in those and we haven't been put under covenant because we have and that's the next point here step six is to put the people under covenant to obey the law so once they know the law, put them under covenant to obey the law. They, they willingly enter into uh, an agreement to keep the law. And then seven is the indispensable task of raising up a virtuous people. Because as we know with the, with the Constitution, um, it will only work with a moral society. It will only work with a virtuous people, right? People looking to, uh, to God, to a higher power, to that for morality. Um, that's only how our American constitution, our, you know, God's law works is if you're looking to him. As soon as you shift that focus away from Jesus Christ, away from God, away from the law, it becomes idolatry. It becomes corruptible. It becomes the, the philosophies of men. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And so um, that's what we see happening today with those wanting us to move away from the constitution, move away from a moral society dictated by the mandate of God, by the laws of God, like we see happening here at Horeb or at Sinai with, with Moses, um, or like we see hap ha that happened with Abraham or with Melchizedek or with uh, Enoch before, right? Or with Adam and the law in the Garden of Eden and Satan tempting uh, again to twist it, to distort it, to contort it. So. His writings highlight, uh, Skousen, Skousen's writings highlight that these are the same principles and the guiding framework that the fathers of America also build by. So look at both the Meridian Church and the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here, eight, you know, post-1830, um, and their structure and focus. The living prophets today are entirely focused on steps five through seven right now. And what are five through seven? Again, make certain everyone knows the law, put the people under covenant to obey the law. What are our temples? But that, like, that's... Covenant machines, right? And seven, the indispensable task of raising up a virtuous people. That is what they've been focused on. Now, this will be a repeat from previous essays, but again, consider this from Elder Christofferson's 2019 October General Conference Address titled, Preparing for the Lord's Return. While at the conference in Buenos Aires that I mentioned earlier, The Spirit made clear to me that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is uniquely empowered and commissioned to accomplish the necessary preparations for the Lord's second coming. Indeed, it was restored for that purpose. Can you find anywhere else a people who embrace the present era as the prophesied dispensation of the fullness of times in which God has purposed to gather together all things one thing, it, all things together in Christ. If you don't find here a community intent on accomplishing what needs to be accomplished for both the living and the dead to prepare for that day, if you don't find here an organization willing to commit vast amounts of time and funds to the gathering and preparation of a covenant people ready to receive the Lord, you won't find it anywhere. Speaking to the Church in 1831, the Lord declared, The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, 
and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth. Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it, and be prepared for the days to come, in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God which is set up on the earth. What can we do to prepare now for that day? We can prepare ourselves as a people. We can gather the Lord's covenant people, and we can help redeem the promise of salvation made to the fathers, our ancestors. All of this must occur in some substantial measure before the Lord comes again. First and crucial for the Lord's return is the presence on the earth of a people prepared to receive Him at His coming. He has stated that those who remain upon the earth in that day, from the least to the greatest, shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord and shall see eye to eye, and shall lift up their voice, and with the voice together sing this new song, saying, The Lord hath brought again Zion. The Lord hath gathered all things in one. The Lord hath brought down Zion from above. The Lord hath brought up Zion from beneath. In ancient times, God took the righteous city of Zion to Himself. By contrast, in the last days, a new Zion will receive the Lord at His return. Zion is the pure in heart, a people of one heart and one mind, dwelling in righteousness with no poor among them. The Prophet Joseph Smith stated, We ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. We build up Zion in our homes, wards, branches, and stakes through unity, godliness, and charity. We must I'm going to stop it right there because that's the end of where I clipped out this. But he's speaking exactly to this last point here. The indispensable task of raising up a virtuous people, making certain everyone knows the law, putting them under covenant, and then raising up a Zion-like people. And this is what he's saying exactly, re reiterating. We are creating a Zion society here on earth to meet the Zion society of heaven at his second coming, at his return. And so this is the continuation of the Lord's work with Israel here in Exodus 18 and 19, teaching Moses these same principles. We live some 3,500 years after the fact, right? But here we are in a nation that was built on mimicked principles that were given to Moses and Aaron, right? We are, uh, again, lifted up on the same church that not only Jehovah in Moses' day was setting up and teaching them the law of, but that he elaborated on himself at the meridian when he came down in flesh himself and was crucified and performed the atonement. And now here we are in the same structure, but 2,000 years after that fact and waiting for his glorious return. These are the latter days, as crazy as that seems. And I think about it often, pondering, like, is it, wow, like, how is it that we were born at this time? But looking all around us now, everything is converging. Like it says here, we, uh, is there another people that is uh, dedicated so much to gather together in one all things in Christ. That, that, is, that is dedicated to embrace the present era, as he says here, prophesied as the dispensation of the fullness of times. It's in the very name of our church that we know that these are the latter days. Joseph Smith was warned that imminent was the coming of the Lord and that there was a short time in this final dispensation for us to prepare up a virtuous people to meet the Lord at that day. So, in the future, we'll continue to elaborate on this comparison between the history of Israel in the Old Testament and the Book of Mormon to the history of the Latter-day Church and gathering of Israel happening now. This episode with Israel in the wilderness is the initial training and building up of a Zion society. The future scattering will spread Israel all over the four quarters of the earth. And today, we are living in the final dispensation and promised gathering and harvest of all those scattered and chosen roots that we're looking at, that the, the initial... Uh, birth of them here in, in the wilderness. God will not forget his covenant promises to Jacob, to Isaac, to Abraham. And we are in the winding up scenes of the Lord's return. And if you don't believe that, here's a quote from, again, 2019, President Nelson in a conference to the youth. He says, you are sons and daughters of God. You already know this. You have sung about it since you were toddlers. But let me clarify a distinguishing characteristic about your identity. You are the children whom God chose to be part of his battalion during this great climax in the long-standing battle between good and evil.
between truth and error. I would not be surprised if, when the veil is lifted in the next life, we learn that you actually pled with our Heavenly Father to be reserved for now. I would not be surprised to learn that, pre-mortally, you loved the Lord so much that you promised to defend His name and gospel during this world's tumultuous, winding-up scenes. One thing is certain. You are of the house of Israel, and you have been sent here to help gather God's elect. Moving on to Exodus 19. In Exodus 19, the chapter heading reads, The Lord covenants to make Israel a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. The people sanctify themselves, and the Lord appears on Sinai amid fire, smoke, and earthquakes. The Lord covenants with Israel to make them a peculiar treasure, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. We also see again fire, smoke, and a thick cloud, and sounds of trumpets and earthquakes accompany theophany, or when the Lord reveals himself to Moses. The condescension of heaven is this. The condescension of heaven to the mount, and associated with this, uh, this is all associated with the presence of God, that phrase. He, in the same presence of God that was being, uh, what do we call it, uh, ch- channeled by Moses uh, in the war of Amalek that we read about earlier. Now, he invites them all to the mountain to come and see him. So he invites all Israel, all three million, to come up. But he sets boundaries of safety around the mount as well. He says, don't come up to a certain point or it could be deadly. Now, I'd like to make a cosmic tetramorph note on verse 4. So when the Lord says in, verse, in Exodus 19, verse 4, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. So let's read it in context here with a few more scriptures around it. In Exodus 19, starting at verse 2, it says, For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So here's my artistic rendition of how the Lord bear them up on eagle's wings through the Red Sea, through that, the, by parting the Red Sea, that the chariot of God, um, as we explored with the tetramorph, has four different distinct you know, images or animals that are associated with it, beings. Here they are down in this picture. We have the lion, the bull or ox, the eagle, and the human, the angel. Right? And all these things are manifest in, uh, you know, in, in association with this throne of God idea that reoccurs through the gospel, or when God comes down in theophany, or, or an endowment of power and presence. These are temple-related, uh, throne of God, judgment seat, mercy seat, all these types of um, concepts and principles, again, coalesce around Christ in the temple on the seat of the throne. And so, again, just a, a cool image I like where it shows this would have been, if we're, again, Velikovsky take on it, uh, this is the planet Venus in eagle form, looking like it being uh, rolling across the heaven on its wings and, and bearing them through, creating a path in its wake for them to cross the Red Sea on dry. So quick reminder that, of the tetramorph. We did explore this in part one. Uh, I've got a link here to that. If you're unfamiliar with any of this, we did go into it in some depth. The eagle is one aspect of the chariot or throne of God. The same Y shape of the wings of the symbol of the eagle here, they're uh, also the same horns of the bull of the heaven uh, bull of heaven that they idolize with the golden calf while Moses is up on the mountain later and we'll get into that but just this y shape um, whether it's arms up whether it's you know the mouth of the lion the the bow of the man the the horns of the ox there's this half crescent shape that always appears around the throne of god interestingly enough we know um, about that being light and plasma induced or the cause of it okay next session in section here we have El Shaddai is coming down, and this is just a continuation there of chapter 19, where the Lord is coming down to the mount. He wants, he he invites the people to come and see him. They, he want, he wants them to come and witness him give the commandments and law to Moses to, to again, partake of their own endowment, to be transfigured in the same sense that Moses was, was being transfigured. Um, So this was the, the invitation to, to live a higher law, essentially. El Shaddai is a name of God that translates to God Almighty. The connotation is one of destruction of Egypt and Pharaoh. Now, here's from our guide to the scriptures. And it says right there, the name of God rendered almighty. And there's a bunch of references where it's used um, in, that, in that same meaning and phrasing. Here's the wiki 
uh, description on it for El Shaddai. El Shaddai, or Shaddai, is one of the names of God of Israel. El Shaddai is conventionally translated in, into English as God Almighty. The translation of El as God in the Ugaritic and the Canaanite languages is straightforward. Shaddai may come from Shad, meaning uh, mammary, or is a dual grammatical number, Shaddaiim, is the typical modern uh, or grammatically plural Hebrew word for human breasts. <laughs> nice. But it's like nurture, right? It's uh, to care for, to give sustenance. Now, um, this is, uh, okay, so they translate it as the Shaddai gods uh, taken to mean none too specific fertility or the mountain or wilderness gods. Okay, so this is where, again, they're providing a uh, fertile um, a way, a promised land, um, and they're a mountain wilderness god. Ma manifested on the mountains, they're a wilderness god. Just all of these things that encompass what was experienced by this exodus, um, that's kind of wrapped into this title or name. And so here I've highlighted this part of like, Discomfort over this, you know, being called a um, wilderness or fertility god and stuff like that. Discomfort over this is sometimes interpreted as controversy, leaving room for other suggestions like a relation to the destroyer aspect of God mentioned at Alia during the Egypt uh, the, during the Egypt affair. So again, just pointing out that this name, the connotation around it is like the destruction of Israel. It's or the destruction of Egypt of the the scenes surrounding the wandering in the wilderness. That the all these things we're talking about are wrapped up in that name. So that's why, to me, it stacks uh, symbolically to have more meaning when you understand and see those things more profoundly. I like this name because of that connotation and how it complements the Exodus is apocalypse theme of our paradigm. We look forward to the great and terrible day of the Lord's second coming in flesh when he's glorified, where the destruction of mystery Babylon and the banishment of Satan will be the modern deliverance in parallel. So while the actual name El Shaddai doesn't appear in Exodus 19, I believe the event described is exactly this type of display of heavenly power and awe that the name God Almighty should evoke. That's why I've titled this section so. Now, also, I want to share a song that I wrote that is relevant and goes by the, the same title, the El Shaddai. So this year with my friends Adam and Tyson, we released our first collaborative album titled Come and See. So very uh, appropriate that this is the Lord's invitation to Israel to come and see for themselves. Um, our album is titled that... Um, and our music project, the group, is called Sons of Ephraim. So again, as our latter-day calling um, to be kind of the purveyors of the covenant of the temple to the rest of Israel in this grand gathering, um, that's what inspires my lyrics. Um, and all this studying as well, this paradigm that I'm sharing with you guys, the it it is always um, distilling in my music. Um, and that's, I think, why I've decided, again, as I've mentioned before, to explain and elaborate on how I see things is because it does kind of go companion, hand in hand with my poetry, with my music. So whether it's um, those of you that are listening and that are interested in this kind of thing and that um, we are reverberating together with, uh, you know, in our exploration of it, or whether it's my family in the future um, to understand the meaning behind my poetry and such a big part of my heart, um, these things will go hand in hand. But this song called El Shaddai, uh, the style of our our group, Sons of Ephraim, it's a fusion of my trap rap poetry <laughs> and Adam's uh, colobite EDM style. Um, and if you're not familiar with him, I've got a link here to his some of his music. It's very awesome. It's usually um, like great EDM with conference talks, general authorities, prophets, their voice kind of voiceovers on top of it. And he'll do often uh, different jams where he's just uh, doing it live on the fly. And uh, I'd encourage you to check out and support my friend Adam and his project, Colobite. Very talented, and I'm honored to work with him. So very cool. And it, of course, it won't play, but... You have the links. You can do that there. Hopefully this one will play. Oh, but we mix... Uh, so so my trap rap poetry is mixed with uh, Adam's kind of EDM flair. And uh, Tyson is an amazing guitarist as well. And he glitters, you know, some magic onto every single track that we send his way. Uh, he, we, just, we just amaze how it comes back with such um, added dynamic and dimensions that his guitar and his ear, his his heart can can add on to what we're doing. So it's, it's awesome. But it's definitely an uber niche genre, almost unto itself. I understand that. So I'll only be slightly offended if you don't like the album or if you don't like the song. It, it's okay. It's, again, it's a, it's more of a consecration of heart than it is a, a plea for attention or anything like that. So, Regardless of how it's received, though, it has been a spiritual blast to work with other talented Latter-day Saint indie artists to create beautiful and Christ-centered things. So here's the song titled El Shaddai, and then we'll go over some of the lyrics after it plays.
With the voice out loud, you'll know what to say. Then climb that rock, grip that rod and pray. With the voice out loud, watch the waters ray. In the name of the great, in the name of the I am I. El Shaddai is coming down. Like Pangea, bring it all together, put Christ in the middle, is the tree of life in the center, hey. And I can walk with the angels, planets arrive, and other worlds are entangled, hey. And it's home sweet home, though, living on the footstool of the king's throne. I can see into eternity, but many your brother but never ever even heard of me. I can travel to the mountain, dance up the river to the source of the fountain. One rock, many different places, many different kingdoms, many different spaces. Out loud, you'll know what to say. Then climb that rock, grip that rod, and pray. With the voice out loud, watch the waters ray. In the name of the great, in the name of the I am I. El Shaddai is coming down. Okay, so again, this is uh, just one track on our album, Come and See. So I encourage you guys, you can purchase it at, uh, I think I've got a link in here as well to somewhere, maybe right here. Let's see if it's Nabu Supply. Yeah, Nabu Supply Co. Uh, we've got a music session for, or a music sec section for indie artists and stuff. There's a lot of Colobite stuff on there, as well as my friend Peregrine. He's got some albums up on here. And then there's our Come and See by Sons of Ephraim. So um, yeah, that's you can check that out and support us that way. Um, let me know what you think as well. I, I love to hear feedback and if people you know what songs they like. I was surprised to hear how many liked this song. And I'll be honest, on the album, out of all of the songs that we made, this was my least favorite sounding song. Um, I love the lyrics, again, because it ties and overlaps with everything we're talking about. Exodus is apocalypse and our future calling, you know, as the sons of Ephraim and things like that, or our calling now to gather Israel and to participate in the fulfilling of these covenants. Um, 
So the entire album is interlaced and interwoven, this tapestry of this vision um, in looking to the past for hints and cues to the present, but also preparing us for the future uh, in the true spirit of prophecy. So um, just every every uh, instance on this where we talk about uh, climb that rock, grip that rod, all of this language, every time I'm talking about the rock, I'm talking about Christ, I'm talking about this same uh, tree of life and tree of knowledge, the iron rod of Lehi's vision, right? It's the same thing. It's the, the word of God. And then these are allusions as well to the Exodus with watch the waters raise uh, in the name of the great, in the name of the I am I, uh, the name the Lord gives Moses to share with Israel to prove it with authority that he is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and, and of Jacob. Um, and then again, he's coming down for his throne to claim, as we talked about, the casting down of, of worldly thrones and the raising up of the Lord Jehovah's throne. Or at the second coming, same, the casting down of mystery Babylon and the raising up of Jesus Christ and his eternal kingdom, his throne. And then I like this verse, like Pangea, bring it all together. Put Christ in the middle as the tree of life in the center. Hey, and I could walk with the angels. Planets arrive and other worlds are entangled. Hey, it's just, I just love how it hops, it flows. But all of this, again, brings in our cosmic perspective. Because like Pangea is what? Bringing together all the continents at the, at the grand gathering at his second coming. Put Christ in the middle as the tree of life in the center. Again, this is the return of the menorah, of the Saturnian column, of this power, uh, celestial, paradisical uh, configuration of planets, the tree of life. And hey, and we can walk with the angels. Why? Because what did Jacob see but angels descending up and down the ladder once it was aligned, this paradisical transfigured earth and angels ascending up and down the body of Christ, right? This this throne. And why? But the the, the earth here, the, the, the footstool. Hey, and it's home sweet home though, living on the footstool of the king's throne. I can see into eternity, but many a brother had never ever even heard of me right? What is this? This is come and see. This is come to the temple. Come to the face of the Lord. Come behold me as I administer the law to Moses. I can travel to the mountain. What mountain? But the temple, but Mount Sinai, but Horeb, but the Mount of Transfiguration, but the Sermon on the Mount, right? But the Temple Mount of Third Nephi, where Christ gives and administers the law. Dance up the river to the source of the fountain. Again, same same imagery, same cosmic uh, river, uh, tree of life imagery to the source of the fountain, right? But what is the source of the fountain? But the rock, the rock of Zion. Many different places, many different kingdoms, many different spaces. For there is no space where there is not a kingdom. For, and now, out on the mountain waiting. Why? What? Because we go to the temple, and we are out on the mountain waiting for the Lord's return, for El Shaddai to come down his kingdom once again in glory and power. So praise with the voice out loud. You'll know what to say. Then climb that rock, meaning endure to the end, right? Go up through the right way, through the narrow way. Praise with the voice out loud and watch the waters raise. Just like our faith, uh, will, our faith will be just like the faith of Moses and Israel as they watch the waters raise, not knowing what to do, coming to the Red Sea with Pharaoh at their back, right? Again, holy. God of the heavens is holy. Three times I say holy, right? Angel of Amun Re, which would have been their, you know, son of God for the Egyptians as they, they're coming out and I'm mixing in a little bit of, of the, uh, the wandering flare of their yearn back to Egypt and to understanding and you know their gods in the form of planetary idolatry as they were trained in Egypt um, to this new, more personal understanding that Jesus Christ uh, is their brother and chosen heir and proxy for the Father who is a glorified man, right? And that resurrection back to the throne with Adam in paradise is our destiny, right? This whole idea, holy God of the mercy seat, save us. Come here, your children. We stand where? Out on the mountain waiting those of us dressed in our garments and waiting for the Lord to return with oil in our lamps. So there's a little glimpse into what I'm feeling and, and the intent behind the poetry I'm writing, at least for this song. Um, so that's El Shaddai, and I just felt it was appropriate for this verse, this chapter, this invitation from the Lord to Israel initially to come up and see. The Lord comes down, El Shaddai is coming down, in glory to Sinai in chapter 19 of Exodus, and Israel is invited to be sanctified and to see and hear for themselves. Let's read through the event and then highlight the timeline. We'll consider the catastrophic display of power that frightens Israel. This is a point positive on our inner acid test, at least just to point out the cosmic things happening with this uh, condescension. We're also going to be recognizing the symbolism associated with this planet, or recognizing the symbolism associated with this planetary encounter will help to decode the reoccurring use of the same symbols in prophecy and temple iconography, like from here on out. Uh, you'll start to see that this is what this is. For example, I have this Nabu sun, uh, sunstone here. It's the triple mountain. It's the same uh, ancient Delaware mountain of God image that we saw before where it's like this tabletop with the round sun with the circle in the middle. 
Um, and then here you have angels and trumpets, the sounds that would accompany this type of condescension or display of power, the coming down of Jehovah as the parting of the Red Sea in Egypt. This type of display, that's what this is. Now, Exodus 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down, I the Lord will come down, in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up unto the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. Okay, so there's this border again, enforced around the mount by penalty of death. There shall not an, an hand touch it, but he shall be surely stoned uh, or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, then they shall come up to the mount. And when Moses went down from the mount upon the people, and he sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes, and he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. So again, uh, continence. Uh, this, this could tie in esoterically if, if you're following that vein into like, uh, never mind. Okay, and it came back to, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. I've got highlighted here. What do we have? Thunders and lightning, thick cloud, voice of trumpet exceedingly loud, all happening on this third day as prophesied. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mount. So they stood at the far part. So nether means it was sort of like peeking on the outside. They're like, oh, are you sure about this, Moses? They were terrified. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended at the, as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called upon Moses or called Moses up to the mount, top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And this is a sad uh, reality when you realize that no unworthy person, or uh, you know, no person who's transfigured and sanctified properly, washed properly, uh, is allowed to look upon the Lord and live. And so he's basically saying they're not worthy. They're not worthy to come see. So don't let them come up. So let's re let's re. Uh, Revisit the timeline here and just kind of point out again what, what I'm trying to highlight with this cosmic appearance, this theophany. In 19.9, he says, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. Well, we just talked about this in the previous uh, part one of this with the shadow of death and all the accompaniment of, you know, this passing body passing over, the, the cloud cover, the particles in the air. Verses 10 through 11, instructions are given to sanctify the people, to wash their clothes and to prepare for the third day. In 12 through 13, a boundary around the mount is enforced by penalty of death, which is a signal to come up and see the Lord, or the signal to come up and see the Lord is a long trump, trumpet blast. And then verses 14, 15, Moses sanctifies the people, washes their clothes, and prepares them for the third day. So they follow through. They're taught, they're instructed, they do it. Verse 16, on the third day in the morning, you've got thunders and lightning, you've got a thick cloud, the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud, and it caused fear in the camp. So all these things happen. Verse 17, Moses brings the people up. They stand at the foot, at the nether region. Then Sinai is altogether on smoke because the Lord came down in fire. The whole mount quaked greatly. The sound of the trumpet waxes long, so Moses goes up, and then the Lord tells him not to let Israel up, for they are wicked. So here's a footnote into 20, uh, 21a, where we have the gaze, like I was just kind of freestyling on there. So let's, let's explore that footnote in 21a there. Um, the privilege of seeing God is what it says. It points to the Joseph Smith translation of Exodus 33:20, where the wickedness of Israel is de is detected and identified by the Lord to Moses. So here, in uh, we'll read that verse, Exodus 33:20 from the Joseph Smith translation. It reads, "And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger be kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee and thy people. For there shall no man among them see me at this time and live, for they are exceedingly sinful." And no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time that shall see my face and live. Now, looking at the Institute's manual commentary on this episode, let's see what they say. It says, Moses sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. Now, if they had accepted all the privileges offered them 
and followed the instruction which would have qualified them to receive the fulfillment of God's promises, they could have been accorded the grandest of all revelations. He offered to come down in the sight of all the people and let them hear and uh, when he spoke to Moses, that they might know for themselves about his will and his law and believe in Moses' future revelations from God and revere the Lord evermore. That was the purpose of why he was in inviting them up so that they could be confident in their prophet. Note the need of cleanliness and spiritual dedication in their preparation for this great spiritual experience. At the prearranged signal, the sounding of the trumpet exceedingly long, the people trembled in anticipation and awe, but apparently they were not fully ready to come up in the sight of the Lord on the mount where Moses was, for the Lord told him to go down and warn them not to come up. Hints as to why this was so are found in the next chapters, in Exodus 20, 18 and 19, and in DNC 84, 21 through 25. But even though their hearts were not fully prepared to endure his presence, they did hear the voice and the words of God as the Ten Commandments were given, as, as will be seen later when we study Moses' review of these great events in this uh, valedictory, in Deuteronomy 4.10, blah, 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 in his valedictory. Following the first two references in the second paragraph above, here are the, hint, here are the hints as to why they weren't allowed up. So right here, Exodus 20, 18 through 9, 19, and then DNC. We'll read these just to see why the Lord explains in other scriptures um, why it, Israel wasn't allowed to come up that first time with Moses. So Exodus 20, this is after he gives the commandments, but this uh, it says here in 18 through 19, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but not, let not God speak with us lest we die. So that's uh, an admission, a self-admission from them to say like, no, we're too scared. You go talk to him, Moses. Let's wait until the prophet says something. We don't need to talk to the Lord ourselves. That kind of idea. And in Doctrine and Covenants 84, verses 21 through 25. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. Remember, this invitation to come up to the mount was literally an invitation of ordinance, a giving of the law, a receiving of the law, a covenanting to take upon us that law. So this was definitely uh, an ordinance where the power of God is manifest. So let me reread this. 84, 21 through 25, 21. And without the ordinances thereof, the gospel, the uh, authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now, this Moses plainly taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they hardened their hearts and could not endure his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. Therefore, he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also. I'm reading this now too, just because we just went over the shadow of death, right? And thinking that this same generation that they're, he's, he's talking about, that uh, rejected Moses and the Lord's invitation to see the Lord, right? Um, they were in, they were, they walked in darkness literally until they said, what? The sun and moon were not fully seen, you know, fully filtered through until they went through Jordan and, and uh, took up the promised land after the 40 years had ended, as Ilikovsky suggests. That just makes this more powerful and, and, and that symbolism behind it of walking in darkness and having things restricted from them by their own uh, sin, wickedness. Consider this warning from Elder Nelson, then Elder Nelson, in his April 2016 priesthood session address titled The Price of Priesthood Power. He says, I urgently plead with each one of us to live up to our privileges as bearers of the priesthood. In a coming day, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Only a man who has paid the price for priesthood power will be able to bring miracles to those he loves and keep his marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. What is the price to develop such priesthood power? The Savior's senior apostle Peter, that same Peter who with James and John conferred the Melchizedek priesthood upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, declared qualities we should seek to be partakers of the divine nature. Now you can go ahead and continue in that talk on your own to um, where he elaborates on those qualities, things like charity and humbleness and faithfulness and things like that. Um, actually, I don't know. I just guessed. <laughs> Let me see if I included it. Now I feel dumb. Let's, let's go over them. To bring the power of the priest. And, and notice that this is, this is a topic often by many apostles and, and, and Latter-day prophets of how can we acquire power in the priesthood, right? 
Well, it's by taking these ordinances seriously and being clean and sanctified, as we see in the scriptures over and over, being kind of those precursors for it. Uh, but let's see. Here at the end, he named faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, and diligence. And don't forget humility. Okay, so I was right. So he goes on about, about these things and, and what it takes to acquire this power. But right here, we're talking about the same things. By those, um, only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself. Okay, this is exactly what we're reading about that the early Israelites rejected, but that now is available to you and I in these latter days through the Holy Temple and the ordinances thereof. And this one more recently from President Nelson in his October 2021 General Conference address titled, The Temple and Your Spiritual Foundation. It reads, We are sparing no effort to give this venerable temple, he's talking about Salt Lake City Temple, which had become increasingly vulnerable, a foundation that will withstand the forces of nature into the millennium. In like manner, it is now time that we each implement extraordinary measures, perhaps measures that we have never taken before, to strengthen our personal spiritual foundations. Unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So I ask each of you, how firm is your foundation? And what reinforcements to your testimony and understanding of the gospel are needed? The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude because the Savior and his doctrine are at the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple, through instruction and through the Spirit, increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. His essential ordinances bind us to him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then, as we keep our covenants, he endows us with his healing, strengthening power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. My dear brothers and sisters, when renovations of the Salt Lake Temple are uh, when the Salt Lake City Temple Salt Lake Temple are completed, there will be no safer place during an earthquake in the Salt Lake Valley than inside the temple. Likewise, whenever any kind of upheaval occurs in your life, the safest place to be spiritually is inside your your temple covenants. Please believe me when I say that when your spiritual foundation is built solidly upon Jesus Christ, that you have no need to fear. As you are true to your covenants made in the temple, you will be strengthened by his power. Then, when spiritual earthquakes occur, you will be able to stand strong because your spiritual foundation is solid and immovable. I love the language in this, again, because it's flowing into everything we've been talking about, from setting up our, our, our entire paradigm and ideology around Christ and his holy temple and the covenants that we make and the promises that are made of resurrection, of uh, gathering, of unity with those that we love forever, right? But also the same language of earth earthquakes, that this harkens back not just to um, all of the things that accompanied the exit of Israel from the, uh, tyrannical Egypt and their liberation through their deliverance, but also this episode here of being invited to live a higher law and see and come and see and hear for themselves to the Lord. But it was the earthquakes and the smoking on the mount and the fire and the trumpets and the lightnings exceedingly sharp that frightened them. They were not prepared for it. They did not understand, right? It was a lack of understanding that led to fear. But in Christ, as we, again, lay our spiritual foundation on him in faith and acquire that power that is being offered to us through the priesthood, then we have no need to fear. And like Moses, we can confidently walk up to speak face to face with the Lord and enjoy his presence and enjoy his love and his healing power. The Lord and his prophet are preparing this Latter-day people to become the prophesied Zion Society of all dispensations that helps to prepare the world for his second coming. You and I are part of that. I would add here that the witness of the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi chapters 8 through 15 plus, I mean through the rest of 3 Nephi, if I'm being honest here. And, uh, oh, we're going to click through and read the chapter headings of each just to get a taste of this. But um, I'm going to add here that this witness in there, we get the epitome of the name El Shaddai on full display in the Americas. There is catastrophic destruction and there is deliverance and organization of the righteous. The righteous survivors of the catastrophe are blessed to see and feel and witness the Lord God Almighty in the flesh to co who come down upon the Temple Mount to deliver to them a new law face to face. Think Sermon on the Mount and his declaration that the law of Moses is fulfilled in him. That Sermon on the Mount, especially in the Book of Mormon account, are a direct tie back to this episode of El Shaddai coming down upon Sinai to deliver the law for a Zion society to Moses but yet they were unworthy to come up. But these examples, especially in the Book of Mormon, these were the righteous and worthy to come up and feel and touch and be healed by him. 
So I want to read through these just because um, it is cool to see this, that this is what we point to as missionaries too when you're teaching about the Book of Mormon. This is the culmination. We want, to, we want them to know that Jesus Christ came to the Americas. But in awesomeness and symbolic overlap, in this stacking sense that we're exploring, this profounder, deeper understanding of things, right? We can see that this pattern is the same as the Exodus with the destruction of El Shaddai coming down. Tempests, earthquakes, fires, whirlwinds, and physical upheavals attest the crucifixion of Christ. And Samuel the Lamanite had prophesied these things before. Many people are destroyed. Darkness covers the land for three days, just like the Exodus. Those who remain bemoan their fate. What happens in 9? In the darkness, the voice of Christ proclaims the destruction of many peoples and cities for their wickedness. He also proclaims his divinity, announces that the law of Moses is fulfilled, and invites men to come unto him and to be saved. So again, here we have the voice of the Lord giving law, essentially, fulfilling law, the law being given on this mount uh, from heaven, right? And it invites all to come and to see him, to come to him. And what happens in, in 10? There's silence in the land for many hours. Then the voice of Christ promises to gather his people as a hen gathers her chickens. The more righteous part of the people have been preserved. Chapter 11. The father testifies of his beloved son. Christ appears and proclaims his atonement. The people feel the wound marks on his hands and feet and side. They cry, Hosanna. He sets forth the mode and manner of baptism. The spirit of contention is of the devil. Christ's doctrine is that men should believe and be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. So he teaches them the true gospel. Again, it's the giving of the law, the upgraded version, the higher law given uh, when he returns in the, in the Book of Mormon times, as well as at the Sermon on the Mount in flesh. He's giving of the higher law. They're very parallel and similar. They are same, they're the same. It's the same gospel. That's why it says here, compare Matthew 5. So Jesus calls and commissions the 12 disciples on the American continent here, just like he did over there. He delivers to the Nephites a discourse similar to the Sermon on the Mount. He speaks the Beatitudes. His teachings transcend and take precedence over the law of Moses. Then men are commanded to be perfect, even as he and his father are perfect. 31. Jesus teaches the Nephites the Lord's Prayer. They are lay up treasures in heaven. Remember how he has promised Israel, just in what we've been reading, that he would make them a peculiar treasure? and a holy nation. This is exactly the same teaching and continuation of that talk. He is the God of Je Jehovah of the Old Testament. It is his chariot throne that has come down in this time in the Americas that has made the destructions happen and that he comes down to heal them that, that remain afterwards, right? This is also an echo, an archetype of what we are to expect at the second coming, that we must be prepared and looking for these things. In fact, in, in the rest of Third Nephi here, he commands us to look to Isaiah, who speaks about these things and warns us to be prepared for such an inversion of truths and realities and uh, of, of, to be caught up in the same snare as the Jews at the time of his first advent, looking beyond the mark, looking for things that we weren't, that, that uh, or not, not expecting things that were plain before us, right? That's what I feel this cosmic layer of the gospel is. These things should be plain before us with our access to see the stars, to experience the signs of heaven, to see things and study information of the past, to listen to the, the voice of the, our ancestors in their mythologies and written in oral traditions and their histories and their, 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 their art, their everything, their music, their poetry, their psalms, right? And to hear what they were actually warning about, that they were addressing the obvious and synthesizing it into their reality. We today in our latter-day environment, we're comfortable looking down at our fake Urim and Thummims, our phones, right? And never looking up at the stars to actually figure out the signs. Um, it's an inversion. It's that great inversion that Isaiah warns about and that the Lord encourages us to, to study and to look, look to. Um, also, the fulfilling of all the covenants that we're talking about in this Zion society, the fulfillment of this nation experiment um, is included in all these instructions that are given. In fact, like we mentioned, this people that Christ comes to visit in the Americas, they go on to live for uh, over 200 years in a Zion-like society, essentially, until people start to forget what happened, right? It becomes distance. Just like we today are so distant from when planets were actually terrorizing the populations of the Earth in previous times that we don't believe that could even happen. That's why everybody's prone to accept the fake narrative put out by the Church of the Devil that the Earth is bajillion years old and things are the way that they are from the beginning just as Peter warned that blasphemers would say in these last days, walking after their own lusts. All right, that's enough of these, but um, it's a good exercise to, again, read Third Nephi in this Moses-Exodus uh, comparison. Um, look, I mean, think of how many times Nephi honors Moses and looks to Moses as inspiration for faith in their exodus and journey from Jerusalem, right? This is a reoccurring theme that um, Moses was, like we said before, and is a similitude of Jesus Christ. 
before he had come in flesh, they looked to Moses as the embodiment of Jehovah and his, his example. So um, it's, it's totally appropriate to look at the, these things in this lens um, to me. Again, people say, why, why, Leland? Why study this cosmic stuff? Why do you care so much about Saturn and these things, blah, blah, blah? And I would just point to what we've been talking about here. Anybody involved in this conversation can see that what we're exploring enhances our understanding, our appreciation, our adoration and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you can't accept that, that we are increasing in our love, affection, understanding, and knowledge of him, then you're willfully blind. We know that this righteous society that Jesus instructed went on to be a Zion for over 200 years. Then the pride cycle again reared its ugly face and Moroni was forced to bury up in the earth their book and of the gospel and those witnesses. And we read in 4th Nephi, uh, Nephi chapter 1, just the chapter heading. The Nephites and the Lamanites are all converted unto the Lord. They have all things in common. They work miracles and prosper in the land. After two centuries, divisions, evils, false churches, and persecutions arise. After 300 years, both the Nephites and the Lamanites are wicked. So what a quick turnaround there. Amron hides up the sacred records. Now moving on to our last section for this article. It's the golden calf episode. So as we just witnessed, the Lord invited the people of Israel to come up and they got to hear the Ten Commandments. They knew what they were doing. Um, and then when Moses stays up and is gone for 40 days, what do they do? But they make an idol um, according to things that they were seeing in the heavens. That's what this, um, th that's the point I want to make here and, and where our cosmic perspective makes total sense of all this. And in fact, is going to elaborate all of the instances of idolatry that are brought up throughout the scriptures by prophets condemning Jerusalem and Judah and, and uh, the tribes for their setting up of idols and and uh, even de defiling the temple with burning incense and worshiping false idols within the, the walls of the temple at, at certain points within Israel's history. Um, all this stuff is reoccurring because it mattered to them, and it should matter to us. But too many people are quick to just put idolatry in the modern v version of it, which we say, oh, well, anything can be my idolatry now. Oh, your video games are idolatry. Or Leland, your obsession with this is idolatry. Or your music or this or anything that you put before the Lord is idolatry. And yes, yes. Nobody is arguing that that's not the case on a personal level. But when you get into these outer layers of society and how things are organized, you see that planetary or idolatry of um, divine beings uh, outside, like cosmic astrology, right? That, this kind of idolatry is always tied to these same things, to the worship of money, to the, the exchanging of materials on earth. Um, that was a little nebulous. I apologize, but we'll, we'll read through this. I hope it makes more sense. So we know the story. Moses is with the Lord atop Sinai for 40 days. During that period, Aaron and Israel cast an idol of worship, a golden calf, in direct disobedience to the Lord's commandments they had previously covenanted to keep. The seminary manual has this to add. It says, Even though the Israelites had recently made a covenant to keep the Lord's commandments, they soon violated that covenant by disobeying the commandments and focusing their worshipful attention and devotion on something other than the Lord, usually the Egyptian gods. For Moses, it was a far greater challenge to get Egypt out of Israel than it was to get Israel out of Egypt. Can't take the ghetto out of it. Yeah, that's that's exactly that phrase right there. So um, here we have here a continuation, I think, from the, the same manual. But some images of the golden calf, very Egyptian-like. This is Appies, I would believe. So growing impatient and hopeless concerning Moses' return, the Israelites desi uh, desired divine images to go before them. The idea of a calf may have arisen from the memory of some gods in Egypt, such as the Hathor cow or the, and the Apis bull. Ironically, after Aaron had fashioned the molten calf, he sought to preserve the idea that it was a feast to the Lord, that they would celebrate by their offerings, their eating and drinking, and their play before the calf. They corrupted or debased themselves through idolatrous worship. Whereas worship of the true God would exalt them, similar effects come still from certain worldly acts in contrast to the value of, of uh, the value from true heavenly ordinances. The Israelites did not make the golden calf in ignorance, but in mischief, for they had been taught the Ten Commandments and had, been prom or had, been, had promised to do all the words which the Lord hath said. And that's from uh, Rasmussen's commentary, Latter-day Saint commentary in the Old Testament. Now, Anthony Larson does a good job speaking to this correlation in the book, uh, or in his book, And the Moon Shall Turn to Blood, in chapter 4. So I'm going to read several pages from that chapter here. Uh, because I mean, he's done great work. We're already pointing to him for a lot of this stuff, and I couldn't say it any better myself with a lot of this stuff. So um, we're going to kind of defer to him. And I, again, I'd encourage you to read his books, um, watch his videos. I know some people are hesitant to because he uh, charges for lessons on, on his website and things like that. I would just say um, 
if you're seeking for truth and information, you can discern it if you want it. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Okay, so from pages 41 through 43 of that book, And the Moon Shall Turn to Blood. Velikovsky's thesis concerning the ancient heavenly manifestations may explain why nearly all ancient religions common, commonly reverenced two images, the cow and the serpent. It may also serve to increase our understanding of scriptural references to these two objects. Although the prophets decried idol worship, they repeatedly used imagery of both the serpent and the cow. The symbols of the ox and the snake were both used by Moses according to the Lord's instruction. Think of that. Now, they worshipped what they saw. The worship of the cow or bull may have begun with the appearance of Venus after its expulsion from Jupiter. Now, again, this is going off the idea that Venus came from Jupiter. Uh, we'll explore later how the Thunderbolts idea is that Venus was a part of the ancient polar column, but that the disruption by Jupiter kicked it out of its position um, and it went awry. So there are different ideas in terms of the birth of Jupiter or when it came and appeared, but most of the writings are pretty um, coherent in that they don't describe Venus as a destructive comet or something interacting with the other planets in the same way until the same era that Velikovsky points out. So that's why he supposes that it was this epic after um, the dissolution of the column from think of Melchizedek's day down to Abraham, down to the famines and plagues and things of the of, of Egypt that caused them to be enslaved by Egypt and stuff like that. And then now you have Venus finally starting to pass by the Earth a little a bit more closely in its erratic orbit, being pushed out by Jupiter's movements previously. That kind of idea. I hope that's as clear as mud. According to Velikovsky, many ancient civilizations referred to Venus as once having been a comet of great and imposing appearance. For an intermediate, uh, for indeterminate period of time prior to the Exodus, Venus moved on an elongated elliptical orbit that carried it across the paths of the inner planets between Jupiter and the Sun. In that orbit, it must have been an imposing sight, a sign in heaven, with a tail that sometimes seemed to stretch the entire length of the sky. Apparently, from time to time, the comet appeared to take the form of a bull's head. Velikovsky wrote, The coma, or the tail, of Venus changed in its, its form with the position of the planet. When the planet Venus approaches the Earth now, it is only partly illuminated, a portion of the disk being in shadow. It has phases like the moon. At this time, being closer to the Earth, it is more brilliant. When Venus had a coma, the horns of the crescent must have been extended by the illuminated portions of the coma. So the tail lit up with the crescent on Venus would have looked like a bull's head. It thus had two long appendages and looked like a bull's head. Aaron was a man who had worked hand in hand with the prophet Moses. He had been called by God to be a spokesman for the prophet. Yet Aaron condescended to fashion a golden calf for the children of Israel that they might worship it, contrary to explicit directions from Moses. It seemed curious that the children of Israel would wish to worship a golden calf in light of the fact that God had so severely punished the idol-worshiping Egyptians. Hadn't the Israelites been delivered just as Moses had promised? Hadn't they witnessed the power of God in their deliverance? More than anything else, didn't they have a good reason to be true to God's commandments? Velikovsky's explanation of the unusual appearance of the comet Venus in the days before and after the Exodus seemed to account, in part, for the idolatry of the Israelites. The children of Israel forged an idol in form of an image which they had seen in the heavens, rather than worshiping the true God of heaven who controls all the elements. The Lord himself, Speaking through the prophet Amos, hundreds of years later, rebuked members of the house of Israel for chronic idol worship. He said, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chayun images, the star of your God, which ye made unto yourselves. Amos 5, 26. That statement from Amos seems to leave little doubt that the image the Israelites worshipped had some relation to a star or a planet. Now, in parentheses, he says, planets were commonly referred to as stars because of their appearance in the heavens. Here are some images I generated to emphasize this visually, that the children of Israel forged an idol in the form of the image which they had seen in the heavens. So they were literally seeing something happen in the heavens that looked like the bull, a bull's head or the cow's head or a bearded woman or a snake-haired woman sometimes, like Medusa, right? Like this is, it changed forms because what? It's a comet and has plan planetary uh, uh, filaments that move and are interacting with magnetic fields in space and with the Earth's and cause these, these uh, reoccurring kind of predictable formations. So these are just some images. Now some people will see these and be like, oh my gosh, that's satanic, Leland. That is satanic. And very, even the very image, I'm saying consider what we're talking about. 
consider that the Satan, as we always talk about here, can only invert. He can only steal. He can only co-opt. So what are the forms that he chooses to co-opt? The cow, the, the goat, right? The lamb, the sacrificial lamb of Christ and the, and the snake, the serpent, the healing serpent of Moses and the bronze staff, right? This is a symbol of Jesus Christ, of regeneration, of resurrection, of rebirth, of healing. All of these things. And Satan co-ops them. Now, our 2023 vision is a mind-controlled, programmed uh, understanding of what these symbols mean and represent. Satan has done a great job of confusing everyone, right? So if you're, if you're uh, grossed out by these images or anything like that, I would say, I don't think you're hearing me. I don't think you're understanding what we're talking about. And maybe this isn't for you. So there are some of the other images. I like this one. This one's the cover I used for it. Just because uh, instead of the horns are looking so satanic, it might have looked like the Star of David up there with the shapes and plasma formations that we were seeing up there. And here uh, I have a picture too of, this is from NASA on the left, showing Venus's uh, active magnetosphere or coma tail that it exhibits even this day, to this day and still connects to Earth essentially as evidence, as Velikovsky suggested, that there had been interactions with our, like a close pass by or pass over and they were still somehow connected. They're in sync as well in terms of their orbits. And I think we'll see a, a Thunderbolts video that kind of outlines this. That'll, that is also evidence that it, Venus has interacted with Earth previously. And then here you have an Egyptian uh, version, vision of the same type of comet with the two horns or tails attached with it. So this is kind of the same idea that we're exploring right here. This, this whole goat, cow, sacred golden calf in, the, in heaven um, was it. Now, also consider this. It's a golden calf because this was lit up gold. It looked gold, the, the, the fire in heaven. And what did it smell like? We just talked about this. Before this planetary God that moved in this shadow of death and darkness, there was an aroma. And what did it smell of? But myrrh and frankincense and gold. And how did the wise men who saw a star and followed it and understood what it might have meant being the God and King of Israel and his sign, the King, very, very, the very King Jehovah, that they would bring these same gifts that they knew heralded the arrival of the King of Israel. So I think this is very fitting. So what was seen as wings of an eagle before can be seen as the horns of the calf in these images. I remember the first several commandments deal with this tradition of making idols out of things seen in heaven. So this was a severe oversight committed in apathy and carelessness by Israel. It's as if, it, it's as if the Lord anticipated this, and that's why he wrote a little extra about the graven images up front in the Ten Commandments. Even the command of not taking the Lord's name in vain is directly related to this initial breaking of covenants with the Lord of, uh, uh, by Israel. Excuse me. And so we read in Exodus 20. The first commandments are, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Four, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not make or take the name of the Lord thy God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So right there, right heavy at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, it's addressing this planetary idolatry. This is the root of idolatry, placing natural things as our central pillar and focus of worship instead of placing Jesus Christ there. Whether those natural things be planets and stars or the nature herself, or whether they be lusts and desires of the natural material man inside of us all, placing anything above the Lord is in direct violation of the very first commandments required for salvation. I want to continue on with Larson in chapter 4. So continuing on here in pages 43 through 45, he identifies the queen of heaven as Venus. Later, the prophet Jeremiah attempted to eradicate the despicable practices of idol worship among the exiled Jews after Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. But the Jews were adamant in their sacrilegious idolatrous practices. They replied to Jeremiah, quote, and this is in Jeremiah 44, verses 16 through 17. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatever things uh, goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her 
as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. So they're basically in the face of Jeremiah saying, no, we're not going to do what you say. In fact, our fathers and grandfathers who worship these planetary idols, they've had and seen good times, and uh, we're going to do the same. The queen of heaven, back to Anthony Larson, that the Jews spoke of here is the same deity that was worshipped throughout the ancient world, the planet comet Venus. The primary aspect of the queen of heaven was the sacred cow, known by various titles, the celestial cow, Athene, or Venus, al Uza, Anat, Astarte, Ishtar, Isis, or Apis. Now see Worlds in Collision, pages 188 through 190. We might even read those. I can't remember if there's overlap or not. But So there seems to be a little more room for doubt here. Or there seems to be little room for doubt here. Venus became the horned god of the ancient world, represented by the ox, the bull, the calf, or the cow, depending on how a particular group of people perceived the sign displayed in the heavens. A horned god which gored the world, spilling blood onto the earth, would have been considered a male deity. But when the same god fed earth's surviving inhabitants with bread from heaven, manna, and caused the streams of the earth to flow with milk and honey, in effect, suckling the people of the earth, the horned god could then also be considered a female deity, the queen of heaven. Hence, most of the gods worshipped in antiquity had both a male and a female aspect. This concept was carried so far in some cases that a few of the gods were considered to be at once both male and female, hermaphrodites. And this is like the Baphomet if you're familiar with the imagery there. Same idea. When the Israelites led, it's like a corruption of understanding these things, how the symbols relate to Jesus instead of how you make up something for what the symbols mean um, for your own wicked kingly designs and, and wicked evil priestly designs. Even the Israelites, led by the prophet of God, succumbed to the awe-inspiring heavenly manifestations. They built an idol, a golden calf, so that they might venerate the sign in heaven. Not only that, but above the above statements together with others from Amos, Jeremiah, the Acts, clearly indicate that the Israelites continued to worship idols for many centuries, contrary to the counsel of the prophets. Prior to the presentation of Velikovsky's theories, many scholars had sought to explain the parallel development of these ideas in many regions through a process called diffusion. They speculated that a religious concept was carried from one culture to another in the course of normal everyday interaction between cultures. In order for the idea of cattle worship or any other religion to spread from one culture to another, however, a respectable amount of time must elapse. Contrary to the diffusion theory, most evidence indicates that this form of idol worship originated almost simultaneously in all cultures. Hence, Velikovsky's explanation for more accu accurately fits the evidence than does the theory of diffusion. So right at the end there, he does a little counterpunch to uh, academics who think that um, or what's their answer to how come there are so many societies, as Velikovsky points out, that worship and venerate the calf or the bull of heaven, right, the sacred cow, and they all seem to appear at the same time. If it was diffusion, if you had one true religion of the cow and then it just changed uh, through, through time, you would have to have a huge gap of time for that diffusion to take place um, or at least a, a reasonable amount of time. But the evidence suggests that all these nations began uh, venerating and worshiping the cow around the same time as all this destruction of the the solar era that Venus sparks off, right? This would be like the end of a sun age, according to like a Native American or, or uh, Mesoamerican uh, mythologies of world development, how it's ruled by different ages of the sun or planets who come down to change the nature of the earth for times. So let's also pepper in some Velikovsky here with Worlds in Collision. This is from pages 124 through 25 in a section titled The Sacred Cow. Give me one second. I need to take a drink. Okay. The sacred cow. The comet Venus, of which, is, of which it is said that horns grew out of her head, or Astarte, of the horns, Venus Cornuta, looked like the head of a horned animal. And since it moved the earth out of its place like a bull with its horns, the planet Venus was pictured as a bull. The worship of a bullock was introduced by Aaron at the foot of Mount Sinai. The cult of Apis originated in Egypt in the days of the Hyksos, after the end of the Middle Kingdom, which would have been about this time. Shortly after the Exodus, Apis, or the sacred bull, which was very much venerated in Egypt, uh, wait, shortly, uh, yeah, shortly after the Exodus, Apis, or the sacred bull, which was very much venerated in Egypt, when a sacred bull died, its body was mummified and placed in a sarcophagus with royal honors. And uh, memorial services were held 
All the coffins and everything excellent and profitable for this august god, the bull Apis, were prepared by the pharaoh. When this god was conducted in peace to the necropolis to let him assure his place in his temple, to let him assume his place in the temple, not sure. The worship of the cow or bull was widespread in Minoan Crete and Mycenaean Greece, uh, for golden images of this animal with large horns were found in excavations. And then I, I sliced in this image from a previous article where we went over this archetype already, the bull of heaven. Um, and so here you have ancient Sumer with the bull iconography, Pakistan, same. You have Sumer, Mesopotamia, Scandinavia with the horns, the arms upraised, the cough form, essentially. And uh, here you have some e Egyptian coffin text words that says, I am the bull, the old one. I support the sky with my horns. Or this one, the pillar of the stars, the bull of heaven, whose horns shine, the anointed pillar, the bull of heaven. Back to Velikovsky. Isis, the planet Venus, was represented as a human figure with two horns, like Astarte, Ishtar, of the horns, and sometimes it was fashioned in the likeness of a cow. In time, Ishtar changed from male to female, and in many places worship of the bull changed to worship of the cow. The main reason for this seems to have been the fall of manna, which turned the rivers into streams of honey and milk, a horned planet that produced milk most closely resembled a cow. In the hymns of the Atharva Veda, in which the ambrosia that falls from the sky is glorified, the god is exalted as the great cow, which drips with streams of milk, and as a bull that hurlest thy fire upon earth and heaven. A passage of the Ramayana from about the celestial cow says, Honey she gave, and roasted grain, and curled milk, and soup in lakes with sugared milk, which is the Hindu version of rivers of milk and honey. The celestial cow, or the heavenly Surabi, the fragrant, was the daughter of the Creator. She sprung from his mouth. At the same time, nectar and excellent perfume were spread, according to the Egyptian ep or the Indian epic. The description of the birth of the daughter from the mouth of the Creator is a Hindu parallel of Athene springing from the head of Zeus. And this would be Jupiter, so the birth of Jupiter idea. Um, fragrance and nectar are mentioned in connection with the birth of the celestial cow, a combination that can be understood if we recall what we learned in the sections Ambrosia and Birth of the Planet Venus. Down to the present day, the Brahmin worship the cow. Cows are regarded as daughters of the heavenly cow. In India, as in other places, the worship of cows began in some period of recorded history. We find in early Hindu literature sufficient information to establish the thesis that cows were once victimized at sacrifices and used at times as articles of food. So he's saying, way back in history, they were eating cows. They were using them as sacrifices and, and uh, consuming them. Then came a change. Then cows became sacred animals. And ever since, the religious law has forbidden the use of their meat for food. The Atharva Veda repeatedly deprecates cow killing um, as the most heinous of crimes. All that kill, eat, or permit the slaughter of cows rot in hell for as many years as there are hairs on the body of the cow slain. Capital punishment was prescribed for those who either stole, hurt, or killed a cow. It says this, Whoever hurts or causes another to hurt or steal or causes another to steal a cow should be slain. Even cow's urine and dung are sacred to the Brahmins. All its, excre uh, all its excreta, excre excreta, all its excreta are hallowed, holy. Not a particle ought to be thrown away as impure. On the contrary, the water it ejects ought to be preserved as the best of holy waters. And you see, that's, uh, that's taking the personification of what they saw in heaven way too far. Uh, yeah. Any spot wh which a cow has uh, condescended to honor with the sacred deposit of her excrement is forever afterwards consecrated grounds. Oh my gosh. Sprinkled on a sinner, it converts him into a saint. The bull is sacred to Shiva, the god of destruction to the Hindu trinity. The consecration of the bulls and letting them loose as privileged beings, uh, as privileged beings to roam at their will and draw respect from all people, is to be noted with particular intense or interest. The freedom and privileges of the Brahmin bull are inviolable. Even when it is destructive, the bull must not be restrained. These quotations show the Apis cult preserved until our times. The celestial cow that gored the earth with its horns and turned rivers and lakes into honey and milk is still revered in the common cow and bull by hundreds of millions of people of India. Now, here are some points for clarity. And this is Leland, just bringing it back. The bull of heaven and pillar archetypes goes back, goes back. The bull of heaven and pillar archetypes go back, goes back. Dang, bad grammar. Go back to the Saturnian golden age with Venus as the heart or inner flame of the heaven man. 
So Venus being in here, and you have the same bowl of heaven archetype. The horns, wings, arms are horns of light or plasma, whether it's the, the light of the sun on Saturn or there's a, a plasma discharge, whether it's like a coma or a tail or even a, a bow shock of moving bodies, right? It can form the bull horns, the same plasma horns or wings. I'm just uh, pointing out that it's they're, they're produced by light. Venus exhibited horns on a pillar during the Passovers of the fourth seal, Exodus Plus. Okay, so just pointing this out for clarity. You have the bull of heaven archetype that applies to our Saturnian configuration before the flood of Noah, and that doesn't change anything. But you also have the bull of heaven, holy cow, celestial cow archetypes coming in later as Venus is moved from this position in the polar column and into her orbit around with the earth and pushing the earth around like a bull is what they're saying, that she was bullying everybody. And Mars did battle with her at certain times to stabilize everything. Like this is uh, the, the story of the battle of the gods in heaven. So I'm just pointing out that that's, that's what I'm talking about. And I, I bring up the fourth seal here. Let's see. I'm referencing Revelation 6, 7 through 8, but also in the context and synthesis of our understanding of dispensations and solar ages of catastrophism. What does that mean? That means if you were following along with, uh, with Come Follow Me this week or last few weeks in Revelation, in our study of the New Testament, we know that the four horsemen of the apocalypse that are very misinterpreted by majority and all, I would say all of Christianity, besides the Latter-day Saints who actually read their scriptures, um, they are a reference to the dispensations of time that are being seen kind of in a, a, a vision of the past um, as the seals are opened by Jesus Christ. So the first seal, it goes back to uh, Enoch is the one, the one on the rider with the horse. Bruce R. McConkie talks about this, that um, it would have been Enoch conquering as a, as a great nation, Enoch's Zion City, that first version of the kingdom of God taken up and, and conquering as Enoch went to battle before the flood with the fallen angels and those who had corrupted um, the earth before the flood. And so on and so forth until the fourth horse, the pale horse, coincides with the same dispensation that we're dealing with here uh, during the Passover. This, the pale horse of death and these things would be the shadow of death and this, this chariot of fire of Jehovah or this bull of heaven that is misinterpreted by others um, and even, even the Israelites there at, at Horeb um, for, for the sacred bull. Um, this, is, this is the Lord um, and this is part of what was seen there in Revelations during that fourth seal. So while Velikovsky contends that Venus was born from Jupiter at some point during the primeval dissolution, the Thunderbolts project has a different birth of Venus take that bridges this gap between planetary manifestations, um, static and polar configuration, to animated in inner solar system passovers. So that's just saying what we just said here. So whether it's static in this polar configuration where Venus is discharging between planets, kind of just going back and forth, or when she was pushed into irregular orbit around a new sun and star and became comet-like, that the manifestations of Venus, um, they're, they're going to bridge the gap between those. It may be that there's some truth in both takes. Perhaps she was birthed from Venus. I don't know. Maybe maybe something else was birthed from Venus. Maybe our moon was the planet in the center and took the place next to us and Venus came through. I'm not sure. We don't know. That's the point. But uh, for a lot of the people who are studying these things very intensely, uh, some some have very strong opinions one way or the other. So I just want to watch real quick this the, the couple episodes from the Thunderbolts here and we'll talk about it. But it may be that there's truth in both takes, Velikovsky's and the Thunderbolts. Here's a good video that speaks to this from the Thunderbolts Project from their discourses on an Alien Sky series or a playlist. Here's number 25, The Great Comet Venus. Also worth a watch on your own time would be episodes 13, 26, and 27 of the same series, Discourses on an Alien Sky. Um, they're very relevant to this whole discussion that we've been talking about with Venus during the Exodus and stuff. So let's go ahead and watch this one real quick. You've just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. The planet Venus our closest planetary neighbor and the brightest star in the sky. Poets the world over have long considered Venus as a celestial symbol of charm and enchantment, the morning star transitioning to evening star, then back to morning star. But more ancient traditions about the planet run much deeper with enigmas at every turn. 
Tales of wonder and terror attached to Venus seem entirely out of place in our tranquil heavens. Within the common theoretical frameworks today, there's just no room for the extraordinary sky-altering events once remembered around the world. The today's quiet planet could have formerly appeared as a great monster, a serpent or dragon attacking the Earth may indeed seem too much to believe. And yet anomalies abound at every turn. Inexplicably, Venus is... We just, we just were talking about um, Venus as a bull, right, as a cow. But remember, um, I think it was right up here when, Villica or when um, Larson starts talking about Velikovsky, because I skipped a bunch of chapters that I didn't include in here, where Velikovsky talks about the serpent form of, of Venus. Um, and, and Anthony Larson talks about this as well, that the comet tail of Venus, imagine it, right? A comet looking like a snake or a dragon in the sky. Think about like the Chinese dragons that they have at New Year's. What are they holding but like a gem or a jade stem, a, a stone or something in their mouth or in their hands at the front of the dragon? This would be like the planet and its plasma tail behind it. This, these are the dragons of antiquity, right? This is um, exactly what they're talking about when he's, when he's saying serpent or dragon of Venus is that it took both forms and it just kind of depended on what it looked like, um, what position it was in, and what it was doing at those times, how it's remembered. Because obviously when it was taking cow form and taking a dump and uh, peeing all over the earth <laughs> or goring it or whatever it might be, it was nurturing it in that it was reverenced as a holy nurturing um, motherly aspect of Venus, whereas um, the serpent, the crooked serpent would be the more destructive form, the El Shaddai destruct, uh, destroying Egypt form of, of the planet. This is the only planet revered globally as a celestial symbol of the mother goddess, both a love goddess, a goddess of unrivaled radiance, and an angry goddess linked to earth-shaking and even world-ending catastrophe. This global contradiction must have an explanation, even if that explanation has been entirely missed in contemporary studies. Today, Venus moves on an orbit 67 million miles from the sun compared to Earth's distance from the sun of 96 million miles. But many clues suggest a historic connection of Venus to the Earth, and these clues include the geometries of their motions today. Both the rotation of Venus and its revolution around the sun exhibit a synchronous connection to Earth's motions. Five Venus years equal eight Earth years. While the usual planetary rotation is from west to east, Venus rotates in reverse, though remarkably slowly in contrast to the solar system norm. A Venus day or full rotation is longer than its year, the time it takes to complete a revolution around the sun. But a Venus year almost exactly matches the timing of its closest approach to the Earth. And at its closest approach, Venus always shows virtually the same hemisphere to Earth. Synchronous or locked-in relationships of this sort when they occur elsewhere in the solar system are seen as evidence of a dynamic connection, either currently or in the past. That's what we're talking about, that this, um, how the orbits of Earth and Venus are aligned indicate that they once interacted and are somehow phase-locked, um, kind of like the moon is to us. Of course, astronomers have long believed that Venus evolved peacefully within its own enclave in the solar system for countless millions of years. Given its proximity to Earth, astronomers assumed the planet to be rather similar to our own, calling it Earth's sister planet and speculating freely on the possibilities of life on Venus. But such speculations ended in the 1960s when probes of the planet stunned astronomers. The first continuous close-up look at Venus's surface came with the Magellan probe. When Magellan moved into orbit around the planet on August 10, 1990, its radar images revealed features as small as 100 meters across. Almost nothing in the earlier picture of Venus could withstand the impact of the discoveries that followed. The surface of Venus has been radically and catastrophically transformed by events yet to be comprehended. The probes revealed a superheated cauldron with surface temperatures averaging more than 460 degrees centigrade or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. In describing the new profile of Venus, astronomers summoned images of a doomsday world. 
Massive clouds of sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide 20,000 meters high create an atmospheric pressure at the surface some 90 times that of the Earth. What has occurred in the evolutionary history of Venus to create a world never imagined prior to the space age? In this discourse and others to follow, we'll explore the astonishing accord between space age surprises and the ancient descriptions of Venus. The greatest surprise for science will lie in the global evidence that Venus formerly roamed the sky as a comet in the language of ancient myths and symbols, the mother of all comets. And this is where we find one of the greatest challenges to today's theoretical assumptions about planetary history. Though Emmanuel Velikovsky was not the first to notice the cometary images attached to Venus, it was his book, Worlds in Collision, published in 1950, that brought the issue to public attention with much greater force than any evidential fragments that preceded his best-selling book. Velikovsky noted many tales of disaster and upheaval in which the agent of destruction not only possessed comet-like attributes, but was named as the planet Venus. And so the anomalous comet-like features of Venus in world mythology became key pieces of a historical argument. He noted, for example, that in Mexican records, Venus was the smoking star, the very phrase natives employed for a comet. He found in both the Americas and the Near East a recurring association of Venus with celestial hair and with a celestial beard two of the most common hieroglyphs for the comet in the ancient world. Another popular glyph for the comet was the serpent or dragon, a form taken by the planet Venus in virtually every land. And the same planet among the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and other races was called the flame or torch of heaven, a widespread symbol of a comet amongst ancient peoples. According to Velikovsky, the history of the comet Venus inspired one of the most powerful themes of ancient myth and ritual, a collective memory of catastrophe, global upheaval, earth-shaking battles in the sky, decimation of nations on earth, an extended period of darkness, and the end of one world age and the birth of another. Having devoted decades to following the global evidence, I can confirm beyond any reasonable doubt that chroniclers the world over did indeed describe Venus as a comet. Not the planet that we observe on a predictable path today, from Egypt and Mesopotamia to Northern Europe and Africa, from the Mediterranean to the South Pacific, from China to the Americas, the sky worshipers remembered the comet Venus with awe and terror. For those who've been following these discourses, we'll connect the global story of the comet Venus to our reconstruction of the polar configuration. The universal fears of comets, traced to the symbolic mother of all comets, without which the global accord could never have arisen in the first place. Why did the appearance of a comet signify the death of a great king? Why, more specifically, was it claimed to be the soul of a deceased king rising in the sky? Our goal will be to show that the myth of the great comet is the story of the radiant star that animated the polar configuration as the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun. The subsequent fate of that star is indeed the story of the great comet. Always look for the underlying form. Mad shout out to the Thunderbolts Project. Uh, I just love their videos, and I love uh, Dave Talbot and Walt Thornhill. I mean, they get a lot of criticism, and it's rightly so when you're putting ideas out, you know, in direct contradiction to an academic behemoth, um, and a lot of internet know-it-alls like myself. You know, you get <laughs> they get a lot of lack va uh, backlash, and um, but they continue to put out amazing con uh, content and. Uh, their followers uh, they've they've made an impact but um just wanted to point it out that it's such a 
a cool way to look at it too when you think that it would be the heart of the heaven man, right? This heart of Adam that comes down and is the agent of Exodus that leads, you know, the people back. That is the symbol of Christ. That it, the Christ is the animating force of the heart of all celestial beings kind of thing. That, that, that the Christ, the light of Christ, um, his, his torch, his fire. I think it's cool. Now, here's the current day supporting evidence for cometary plasma light horns as well. So here's again from the Thunderbolts project, but this is their um, news kind of update. I think recently with some of the deaths they've had in the organization for Thunderbolts, they haven't been putting out regular uh, space news types uh, information that they, they were in the past, um, but they're just kind of like putting out essays in video form or reaction videos to things happening in, in uh, astrophotography with the James Webb telescope and things like that. Um, I, I don't I don't know what's going on over there, but here's a, a cool video that was put out a few months ago about um, a comet that made news called the Devil's Comet because of the horns that were seen on it. So let's just watch this. We, we might not need to watch all of it, but this will be a more technical take on the on the horns that we just explored with Venus here. In the last few months. A quote, unusual comet has produced dramatic and unexpected activity that has puzzled astronomers. The comet 12P Pons Brooks has been dubbed in science media the quote, devil comet, because of its two bright tails resembling horns, as seen in this image taken at the Lowell Observatory by Dr. Teddy Carita. Since July, the enormous comet, whose nucleus is about 12.4 miles across, has produced two dramatic outbursts, most recently in October. The puzzle for astronomers is the comet's tremendous distance from the sun. As described in an article published on sciencealert.com, these outbursts have been particularly interesting due to their frequency and where they occurred. One theory is that comets contain forms of ice that, when exposed for the first time to heat from the sun, cause volatile explosions. But those explosions have typically been observed closer to the sun, and not often. According to Carita, Quote, it might happen twice in five years. The Pondsbrook Comet, by contrast, is exploding relatively often and confoundingly far away from the Sun. Right now, it's further off than Mars, Carita noted, where, quote, it's just not that warm. That raises the question, where is the energy coming from that powers these kinds of large outbursts? And the fact that it can apparently do so many so often. On these mysterious outbursts, Dr. Carita elaborated, in Pons Brooks, these are really, really bright, really, really large outbursts. And this is what makes the comet so interesting to scientists. Now, my most recent Thunderbolts video addressed the increasingly problematic observations of asteroids that produce dramatic comet-like activities. I began the presentation with a review of Wal Thornhill and David Talbot's remarkably successful predictions on NASA's Deep Impact mission of 2005. To those familiar with the electric comet theory, the significance of repeated, dramatic cometary outbursts at vast distances from the Sun is self-evident. However, for any newcomers, I always like to begin any discussion of comets with a brief overview of the electric universe perspective. The electric comet theory, which rejects the centuries-old and highly problematic solar nebular hypothesis, has always proposed that comets are not icy blobs that accreted or condensed at the dawn of the solar system, supposedly billions of years ago. This prediction has been vindicated by every comet mission, which have all revealed comet nuclei that are desiccated and shockingly geologically complex. Comets, as well as asteroids and meteoroids, were born far more recently, torn by electrical discharge from the surfaces of planets and moons, in a relatively recent epoch of planetary instability. The massively cratered surfaces of airless worlds are the birthmarks of these celestial bodies. Because comets are not the dirty snowballs of standard theory, they do not slowly sublime due to solar warming. Comet activity, including the production of comet jets and a cometary tail and coma, are fundamentally electrical activities, as evidenced by comet X-rays, which were not predicted by standard theorists, as well as other plasma phenomena. Water molecules and other signatures of so-called volatiles are created electrochemically and released into the cometary coma, a process similar to November of 2000. Okay, I just want to pause it there because that's a good introduction to what he's talking about, this electric comet idea um, that when you attribute, as we're constantly trying to remember that 
we're we're putting a new foundation, a new paradigm into our understanding of science and cosmology, astronomy, and astrophysics. And that big um, foundational change we're making is putting electricity in space, that these bodies are charged um, a certain way. That's why they're outbursting, that it's a plasma phenomena because they're swimming through ionized particles and that they have a charge themselves moving from the outer solar system to the inward solar system where the charge differential is different it initiates a discharge and that's what it is it's not sublimation of ice that they're getting warm and because that's why they're they're so worried that or they're so concerned that they don't understand why this comet they're looking at right now is having so strong and many outbursts what they're calling it um so far away where it's not hot because the only mechanism they're attributing those outbursts to is sublimation, when ice melts off, essentially, because it gets hot. Um, and, and what we're saying is, no, it's an electrical plasma phenomena that you're watching. Like, that's, that's the whole idea. And that it's predictable, and that we're seeing these horn shapes that are described in mythology right now with our telescopes and cameras, and we're not putting it together because people don't want to open their eyes, that the foundations that we're you know, judging these things by might be incorrect. <laughs> that's that's essentially what it is. But I wanted to show a couple more of these images of the Demos comet because you can see the plasma shockwave that some of our telescopes are picking up. You can see how if it were illuminated, lit up like the northern lights or bright white or yellow or gold, that it would look like giant bullhorns uh, or the mouth of something or wings of a bird or all of these forms and animals and shapes that we're describing in, in the iconography, right, that the plasma morphology is demonstrating to be true to it, that this is what we're looking at. 2007, it had become the largest object in the solar system, visibly larger than the sun. The comet's coma had grown from 28,000 kilometers to 7 million kilometers. At the time of Holmes bursting quickly away from the I comet, don't know what else I wanted to see on this. Holmes' spectacular brightening was reminiscent of a... Other than the, the initial picture of this comet here at the start, the... In the last comet, few months, this thing with the two horns. So, anyways, that's I like the Thunderbolts videos. They're very educational. Um, some of them are a little technical heavy. You're gonna have to watch them a few times to really grasp the the concepts. And you, to me, I understand this because I've I've watched like all their videos and I studied astronomy and these things before in college. So, like, this is language that's familiar to me. So, I mean, it's still even hard for me to keep track, and um, I have to like pace myself and and learn these things as well. But um, just keep at it. It's just like anything else. It just takes time, practice, commitment, and energy to see how these people are describing things that um, I didn't know there were other explanations for it when I was going through college. And so that's why I'm so eager and excited about what the Thunderbolts is doing. Plus, because they're interdisciplinary scientists, and that's what I was studying, and not once did anybody at my school ever point me in the direction of people outside of the academic circles doing interdisciplinary stuff. So to see that like these are the rebels out there, these are more of my people, more of my speed, uh, I'm excited to, to see them and find them. Okay, so I want to include another section from Anthony Larson's uh, And the Moon Shall Turn to Blood book on this topic here of the planetary idolatry and the golden calf. And this is on pages 55 through 57. He writes, Astronomy, Astrology, and Idolatry. Because several close planetary encounters have occurred in the past, we find that at various, um, at various times, man has worshipped the several agents of those destructions. These are the planetary gods, worshipped by pagans, as they were called by the early Christians. The prophets called such pagans idol worshippers, because they made and reverenced images or idols of their planetary gods. The ancients anxiously followed the movements of heavenly bodies, knowing that irregular planetary motions could portend renewed cataclysms on earth. That fear of the planets may explain why astronomy was so important to the ancients. Their temples, pyramids, and great monoliths served as astral observatories as well as centers for religious rites and rituals. Much time and labor was spent in constructing those tremendous structures and in watching the planets march across the sky. Those who best understood astronomy rose to a high status in such communities. This may also be the reason why the religious of the ancients or the religions of the ancients were so intimately associated with astronomy. Celestial bodies were the focus of ancient religion. Fear of renewed destruction wrought by the planet's gods uh, impelled men to render obeisance to the images that represented those fearful forces. And over time, human characteristics were attributed to the celestial events. For example, covering oneself with ashes, as did the Israelites, or painting one's body red, as some American Indians did, or sacrificing humans in bloody rituals, as pagans did, the world over, or rituals of passing through the fire, all entail reenactments of elements of past destructions. In addition, the ancients exhibited intense interest in the movements of the planets. Hence, the astronomers also served as the religious directors, or priesthood, of their communities. 
Where the prophets held sway with their teachings, the line between worship of God and cosmological idolatry was clearly delineated. Abraham worshipped the true God, and yet he was a great astronomer, as witnessed by his writings. But where the people rejected the prophets, the line between religion and cosmology became less distinct. Much to the distress of holy men of God, the planets themselves became objects of worship, along with the natural elements which became the destructive agents of the celestial gods. Rather than preserving the planets, or rather than perceiving the planets as agents of the Creator, the idol worshippers chose to worship the planets themselves as gods. I think this is a really important part of this whole um, section. Let me read it again. So rather than perceiving the planets as agents or tools, right, of the Creator, the idol worshippers chose to worship the planets themselves as gods. This was an integral part of the mission of the prophets, to teach and preach against the perverted worship of planetary gods in the form of idols. Astrology also appears to have originated from ancient cataclysms. Astrologers attempted to augur the fate, or divine, the fate of man from the heavenly positions of the planets. This logic seems reasonable considering that in past encounters man's destiny was profoundly altered by the direct intervention of the planets. In the times since the last planetary encounter, astrology has de degenerated to become a parlor game, an amusing pastime, but at one time it was a form of worship. Naturally, ancient astrology was steeped in mysticism and mystery. It, se it seems safe to say that without the guidance provided by the prophets, the ancients mistakenly looked for guidance to the planets rather than to God himself, the great architect of the universe. In so doing, they deluded themselves and subsequently fell into futile, perverted, and self-destructed practices. So once you shift your focus away from God himself and put it onto a planet, onto a thing, onto fate, onto chance, onto an idol, onto your money, onto your own arm of flesh, whatever it might be, um, ultimately it will be a futile attempt, a perverted attempt, and a self-destructive uh, attempt to save yourself. It was a constant battle for Israel. The temptation to shift focus from the Lord Jehovah to other gods, other lords, especially planetary ones anciently, was overwhelming for the nation as a whole. Eventually, this apostasy would be the reason for the scattering of Israel. Consider Deuteronomy chapter 4, well, the whole thing basically, but from, from 1 through 40. Read them all in context and given uh, what we've gone over in this essay. Let's read the chapter heading here and I'm just going to read what I picked out. So in Deuteronomy 4, Moses exhorts the children of Israel to keep the commandments, to teach them to their children, and to be exemplary before all nations. They are forbidden to make graven images or worship other gods. They are to witness that they have heard the voice of God. They will be scattered among all nations when they worship other gods. They will be gathered again in the latter days when they seek the Lord their God. Moses extols the mercy and goodness of, the, of uh, God to Israel. So again, in, in terms of understanding the gathering of Israel, which President Nelson has said is the most important thing going on in the world right now, here is the Lord himself saying why Israel was scattered in the first place and why? Because they were worshiping other gods, idolatry, right? And right now, as we're studying it, planetary idolatry is the most obvious form that was, they were most easily pers persuaded by because it was the most demonstrable. It was something very evident that everybody else was doing and um, talking about. Today, it's awkward to talk about planetary worship or astrology or any of these things when the planets are so far away. And in our minds, in our brainwashed understanding of the universe, we think that it's been that way for a long time. And we don't understand that the very things we read in the scriptures are telling us that the heavens were different in, within, within, mem uh, within the memory of man recently. Okay, so this is pointing back to our El Shaddai episode where they made their graven image and the Lord came down. Now, Deuteronomy 4, verses 15 through 19, we're going to talk about how he's directly pointing out planetary idolatry, essentially. So in verses 15, starting, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of multitude on the day of the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. So he's saying, you didn't see anything. Okay, so how can you make a similitude of anything you saw when you, we, I know you didn't see him. He didn't let you see him. So why are you trying to pretend like you can make an image of what God looks like? That's essentially what he comes out swinging with. Verse 16, he says, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure and the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth and the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. Think of the tetramorph again, where he's talking about that. The beast with the horns or the lion or the winged fowl with the, with the wings of the bird or the male or female, the form of the man. 
the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, and any likeness of any fish that is in the waters be, uh, beneath. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and whence thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord hath taken you, and hath brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, and ye are this day. So he's talking directly to, if you're going to worship the hosts of heaven and make images unto these things you see in heaven or in the sea or beneath the earth or whatever, he's like, you're, you're in for a, a problem. Later in that same chapter, verses 25 to 30, 31, he says, and here's the promise to scatter them, basically. He says, when thou shalt beget children and children's children and, um, and ye have remained long in the land and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or a likeness of any thing, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall be utterly destroyed. So he's telling them, I'm telling you not to do these things. I'm going to let you into the promised land, and you're going to do these things. That's So he's, he's laying it out. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in numbers among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods and work of men's hands, or the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, now here's the turnaround, thou shalt find him, if thou shalt seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God, for he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy father, which he sware unto them. So the promise is to scatter and gather Israel. It hinges on our or their worship of the Lord. In many other places throughout the Old Testament, this refrain against worshiping the planets and stars or the host of heaven is evident once your heart and mind have been trained to consider the proper context of the times. Planetary idolatry was punishable by stoning death. From Deuteronomy 17, we read, If there be found among you, in verse 2 through 5, within any of thy, uh, thy gates which the Lord thy God hath given thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun, or moon, or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it, and inquired diligently, and behold, it be true, and the thing certain, that is an abomination, or that, that such an abomination is wrought in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman, uh, which hath committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. Now from 2 Kings 17, verses 6 through 23. And they rejected his statutes and his covenants that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them. So again, the influence of the surrounding nations concerning whom the Lord God charged them that they should not do like them. Verse 16. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made unto them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So there we have in the reign of kings with the division of uh, the nation of Israel, you have them devolving into this planetary idolatry like full out making molten images again. See wicked king Manasseh as well in Second Kings 21. Manasseh is the worst. Manasseh turns Judah to idolatry, even sacrificing a son to a heathen god. Prophets foretell of the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. Wickedness continues under Ammon. So, verses 1 through 4. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. Again, these would be altars unto the planet of Venus. And he reared up altars for Baal, and he made a grove, and did Ahab, as did Ahab uh, king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. 
So again, another example, straightforward of planetary idolatry. Then you have King Josiah, who plays the Uno reverse on the planetary idolatry for the time in Second Kings 23. So you have a positive uh, re, uh, reaction to the negative ap uh, apostasy of planetary idolatry. Josiah reads in verse uh, Kings, Second Kings 23, Josiah reads from the book of the covenant to the people. They covenant to keep the commandments. Josiah overturns the worship of false gods. He removes the Sodomites and puts down idolatry. Idolatrous priests are slain, and Judah holds a solemn Passover. Egypt subjects the land of Judah. So, uh, verses 1 through 3. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up unto the house of the Lord, and all men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. So he taught them the law. And the king stood by a pillar, and he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord. So here he's applying that next part of a Zion-like society, reestablishing re re these uh, laws given to Moses, letting the people know of the law, and then making a covenant uh, under him. And look what he stood by, but a pillar, right? To, again, arms upraised, stretched, uh, harken back to this paradisical covenant of a celestial um, atonement to be offered by Jesus himself. Now, and to keep commandments and his testimonies and his statues and all their uh, with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. So again, teaches them the law, makes them covenant to obey the law. There is Josiah restoring things to the proper order. Jeremiah condemns Jerusalem for these same previous sins or tendencies of worshiping the host of heaven in Jeremiah 8. Here he is in Jeremiah 8, chapter heading says, Calamities will befall the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For them the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and they are not saved. So verses 1 through 3. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread before them the sun, and the moon, and all the host of heaven whom they have loved, and whom they have served, and whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried, for they shall be dung upon the face of the earth, and death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. So he's like, guess what? When the resurrection happens, you'll be as dung, and the, the gods you've chosen to worship, which he points out are these planetary hosts of heaven, right? Uh, yeah, they won't serve you in that time. Ezekiel in chapter 8 sees a vision of the wicked idolatry of his people and even the worship of the host of heaven in the temple. So in Ezekiel 8, Ezekiel sees in vision the wickedness and abominations of the people of Judah in Jerusalem. He sees idolatry practiced in the temple itself. So here we have verses 13 through 18. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Uh, another god. Uh-oh. What the? Why are you doing that at the temple? Then he said unto me, this would be like them worshiping the mother, uh, heavenly mother or something today, com comparable. That's like the lean into what we're leaning to. Right now, it's like the worship of nature, but in Latter-day Saints, you have people that are being persuaded by that eco-fascism, and they're associating our doctrine of heavenly mother with it, and so it's it's coming back. And as planets start to move, as things start to get more hectic around the world, you better watch how we will devolve as a people and the apostasy within us to a planetary idolatry just as Egypt and past. If you start seeing a planet or a comet or the, the heavens being disturbed from their orbit, you better believe these same people who are willing to worship Heavenly Mother now will be worshiping the planets just with all the other heathen as they, as they come. Okay, back to the scripture in 15 through 18 of Ezekiel 8. Then, he said, then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house within the temple. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. And their fa so that's significant, backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. And then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And remember, he's always talking about planetary, uh, worshiping other gods, provoking him to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. He says, therefore, will I also deal in fury? Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Amos chapter 5 calls out planetary idolatry. In verses 21 through 27. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. 
see they've made a perversion of what was experienced during, during the exodus with the feast of you know being fed by god and the great smells and dancing and celebration the song of moses like all of these things hearken their deliverance from uh, being slaves like what a joyous occasion it was to be honest they needed temperament though and uh here you have the, the the pendulum swinging too far when you apostatized with these things as like your foundation using feast days as or holy days as unholy days you know as uh, feast days as sexual perversions and things like that like they do today everything's inverted so he says i will not smell your in uh, i will not and i will not smell in your solemn assemblies it says though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings i will not accept them neither will i regard your pe- the peace offerings uh, of your fat beasts it says take thou away from me the noise of thy songs for i will not hear the melody of thy vials but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? He says, No, but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chayun, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name it is the God of hosts. So he flexes on him. He's like, did you guys wander in Israel? Because this is Amos talking in a later time. And he's, he's hearkening back to the Exodus. And he's like, did you guys walk 40 years in Israel? He's like, did you? No, but you actually built up the temple and tabernacle of your false idols, of your Moloch and your Chayun, of your images, of the star of your God. So he's saying, not my star, not my throne, not my chariot, not my glory, not my presence did you call down, but that which ye made to yourselves. He says, therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity. And what does he call himself? He says, thus saith the Lord, whose name it is the God of hosts. He's like, the hosts you worship, bro, I am the creator of them, is kind of how he flexes on him. That's how I read it and see it, and it's powerful. We can even open the more obscure books like Zephaniah chapter 1 and see plainly what is being said in this broader planetary uh, planetary idolatry context. So here's Zephaniah chapter 1. He's also prophesying the destruction of Judah is symbolic of the second coming. It is a day of the Lord's sacrifice, a day of wrath and trouble. Verses 1 through 6. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, and the son of Hiskiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with which the wicked, or the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I recognize these animals and these things that he's talking about as directly related to the other scriptures condemning graven images of these such things of these things being placed above him these stumbling blocks and he's talking about consumption right who's the one that consumes the sacrifices upon the altar what is the the throne the altar of sacrifice but a a lion throne as we've seen an altar of consumption like the sun consuming and giving life all in the same double-edged sword like his word coming from his mouth now verse four i will also stretch out mine hand upon judah and upon all the inhabitants of Israel, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place, and the name of the Chema, uh, the, the Kemarims with the priests. And the Kemarims are our idolatrous priests of Moloch, basically, of Baal. And them that worship the host of heaven, again, upon the housetops in the high places, and them that worship and are uh, and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcham. And Malcham is another form of uh, Moloch, basically. A national idol of the Ammonites. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired of him. So again, this turning your back to the temple, to your, your back to the Lord, not repenting, that's what this idolatry is the ultimate expression of, essentially, is really turning your vision uh, away from the Lord to something totally different, walking in path of darkness. These are just a few of the scriptural passages that can be found that are supportive of this underlying battle for the mind and heart, the attention and the worship of Israel between the Lord Jehovah and his prophets and the pagan planetary idolatry with all the associated feasts and whoredoms of the surrounding nations. We will end this part three here and pick it up with the tabernacle in part four. Uh, I've skimmed over a lot of really good information that I encourage you to find and dig up for yourself in uh, if you read Worlds in Collision by Velikovsky or Anthony Larson's Prophecy Trilogy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not going to be able to get to in this, and maybe in the future we will, but uh, don't hate me for it. Again, I'm just providing this. This was supposed to be just like a snapshot of, look at all these these places that uh, support this paradigm, this electric universe idea being synthesized with the gospel. When we see it through this light, it illuminates the scriptures even more. 
And as I have started to go through them, I realize, man, I actually want to spend more time like I'm doing with these, um, even though it might extend this podcast and, and the presentation of the scriptures in the electric universe into like a part 12 uh, until we get to the end. I think I'll just do it that way um, because I'm enjoying diving into these the way that we're diving into them. So I hope you appreciate it. I hope you're getting something out of this more than anything. I hope um, like I feel that we are all learning more about Jesus Christ and loving him more and finding ourselves wanting to be like him, wanting to honor him, wanting to be worthy to be a peculiar treasure of his you know, worthy to have a white stone, to be one of his gems and jewels, a forever pillar established in his temple, right? To receive those blessings for those who overcome, to be one who hears when he speaks, to be one who sees when he visits, to one who knocks and who it is opened unto. I hope that uh, you guys have a wonderful Christmas season. Merry Christmas to all. I love you. Thank you for your time and may God bless you. Take care. Thank you.